The Gray Phantom by Herman Landon. Chapter One A Tragic Interlude. Hours afterward, when the tragic spell had broken and scraps and odds of the affair began to throng the memories of those present at the opening performance of His Soul's Master, several persons remembered that a curious hush had preceded the fateful moment. No one could tell why, but of a sudden all sounds had ceased. Subdued whispers, the creaking of seats, and the frou-frou of garments had stopped, as abruptly as if a silencing signal had gone through the little auditorium. The spectators had sat motionless, momentarily holding their breath, and even the voices of the actors had faltered for an appreciable second or two. The stillness had been charged with an uneasy tension, and it seemed as though a telepathic whisper of warning had been communicated to the gathering. Vivian Tennant, as frivolous as she was delicately molded, declared the following day that the silence during those few moments had been so intense that she was positive she had heard a pin drop from the coiffure of the woman on her left. Alex Hammond, forty and cynical, would have ascribed the spell to a touch of necromancy had he been a believer in such childish things. Mrs. Hungerford Cather, a frail little widow with a melancholy disposition, said she felt just as though she were at a seance, and a ghost was expected to appear any moment. The others described their impressions with varying degrees of vividness, but all of them agreed in having felt the creeping approach of a silent and invisible horror. Only Helen Hardwick, whose fresh young charm and frank brown eyes made her seem strangely out of place in that motley gathering of rouged lips, sophisticated banter, and gowns suggestive of the Parisian boulevards, was singularly uncommunicative in regard to what she had experienced during the weird interlude when the Thelma Theatre became the scene of one of life's grimly realistic tragedies and her silence was all the more remarkable because she had seen, heard, and felt more than any of the others. The Thelma, with its walls of common red brick and severely plain architecture, might have suggested anything but the setting of a dark and mysterious crime. Outwardly, the building, located in a section of New York largely given over to tenements, unsoaped children, and garlicky odors, presented an air of solidity and matter-of-factness that left the imagination untouched and gave no hint of the interior. The inside was as colorful and fanciful as the outside was unlovely and prosaic, and it was rumored that Vincent Starr, the eccentric owner, had spent a fortune on the decorations. Like many other rich man, Starr had his hobby, the newspapers and the critics had scoffed and railed when he opened the Thelma and dedicated it to the uplift of dramatic art. He held the Broadway production in lofty contempt, declaring that they catered only to the vulgar tastes of the rabble. Admission to the Thelma was by invitation only, and the auditorium seated exactly ninety-nine persons, for it was Starr's firm opinion that out of the city's five million only an infinitesimal few were able to appreciate true histrionic art. Members of the daily press were never admitted, and the only critics present at the performances were the representatives of two or three obscure journals who shared Starr's aesthetic views. The owner and director of the Thelma was prejudiced against music at theatrical performances, and where the orchestra pit should have been, was an exquisite statue in marble, representing Aphrodite springing out of a foaming sea. Along the walls were friezes picturing the Nine Muses, the work of a famous mural painter, and the domed ceiling showed colorful glimpses of Dionysian festivals. Scattered throughout the auditorium and in niches in the walls were superb vases containing flowers whose fragrance filled the air. The effect of the whole was sumptuous rather than harmonious, and it was characteristic of Vincent Starr's freakish tastes and clashing impulses. 
and among the audience at the premiere of his soul's master there was not one but thought that the brilliant and fanciful setting lent a touch of incongruity to the tragic byplay enacted off stage the moment she stepped into the box reserved for her father and herself helen hardwick felt she was in a strange and somewhat oppressive atmosphere the faces in the audience were unfamiliar and everybody stared at her in a way she could not understand until she suddenly remembered that among these people she was something of a celebrity vincent starr who sneered at the biggest dramatic successes of the year had not only accepted her play for production at the thelma but was himself playing the principal role and he was indulging in much self-flattery over having discovered a budding genius in the author of his soul's master that explained the curious glances turned in her direction it was both amusing and bewildering she thought nothing but a whim had caused her to enter her play in the prize contest conducted by starr to obtain suitable material for his theatre and its acceptance had been the greatest surprise of her twenty-three years her only other serious attempt had been a sketch produced by a dramatic society at bernard in her junior year his soul's master had been a slightly more ambitious effort and it had been inspired by vague emotions which she herself could hardly understand but for all that it was a simple artless thing with a theme as old as the story of the garden of eden it was nothing more than an allegorical fantasy depicting the forces of evil and good struggling for possession of a man's soul how a play of that kind could have appealed to an eccentric and highly sophisticated genius like vincent starr was beyond her but the curtain had been up only a few minutes when she began to understand in the part of marius the mortal for whose soul the spirits of light and darkness were contending starr had found a role that matched his temperament to perfection the opening monologue in which marius revealed himself as tiring of a life of refined villainy and roguish adventures had not proceeded far before she saw that the role had so gripped and stirred him that he was living the part rather than acting it the lines throbbed and sparkled with life and passion and starr was completely submerging his own emotions in those of the hero it did not take helen long to see that it was the character of marius rather than the flimsy fancy woven around it that had caused starr to accept her play she had heard he was vain and egotistical and no doubt he reveled in the opportunity for self-exaltation that the role afforded him as the play went on from scene to scene another impression began to take root in her mind here and there in the lines she noted an odd cynical twist or a bit of ambiguous phrasing that she was sure had not been in the manuscript the tempting voices and gestures of the spirits of darkness were more appealing than she had intended and the exhortations of the spirit of light were correspondingly feebler she thought she understood why star had found excuses for not admitting her to any of the rehearsals she was inclined to resent the liberties he had taken with her lines but again she was carried away by his impassioned rendition of marius the very life-blood of the character seemed to pulse in star's veins marius had seemed very real to her while she was writing the play but not so real by far as she now saw him on the stage of the thelma theatre she leaned forward and watched him with growing interest and wonder it was as if a being that had existed only in her thoughts and in her heart had suddenly materialized in flesh and blood it was weird now and then there came a touch of subtlety an odd turn of speech or a telling gesture that she instantly recognized although she knew it was interpolated by the actor she had heard and seen them all in imagination but not clearly enough to reproduce them on paper the gestures impressed her most 
she knew and recognized them all from the slightest to the most elaborate although she had visualized only a few of them clearly enough to be able to put them into the play it seemed as though the actor in expanding and vivifying his role had made use of material that had existed only in the playwright's mind impulsively she reached out her hand and placed it over her father's mr hardwick curator of the cosmopolitan museum and an authority on assyrian relics started as if his mind had been roving among prehistoric scenes why child your hand is cold he whispered anxiously aren't you well yes dad i'm all right her large brown eyes avoided his searching gaze how do you like my play she scarcely heard his answer for a moment she had turned her eyes from the stage and let them wander over the dimly lighted auditorium and of a sudden a face in the last row of seats held her glance it was a striking face though helen would not have called it beautiful somehow the curve of the haughtily tilted chin repelled her the features were perfect in a cold unalluring way and the faint curl of the lips and the designing look of the eyes made her think of a velasquez portrait the woman sat alone the seats to right and left of her being unoccupied and the heavily shaded electric light on the wall at her side drew a thousand flashing tints from the jewel in her hair it was not the face that held helen hardwick but rather the fixed shrewdly scrutinizing look with which the woman was regarding vincent starr she followed his every motion and gesture with the sly persistence of a cat watching a mouse now and then she bent forward and her lips twitched in a knowing way as if she were thinking of something that pleased and amused her even while it startled her a little helen studying her with a puzzled look found herself wondering whether it was the man or the actor that interested the woman so profoundly with an effort for the woman in the rear of the house had already begun to pique her imagination she once more turned her eyes to the stage again she marveled and wondered she had an odd feeling that something was going on before her eyes which her reason told her could not be quite real Starr's perfect mastery of the role seemed almost supernatural the slight quick motions of the hands the occasional backward toss of the head the odd habit of gazing down at the fingertips when in deep thought the set and swing of the shoulders the minor but characteristic peculiarities of speech and gesture all belonged to the marius she had seen and known and Starr's recreation of him struck her as uncanny of a sudden she felt a little dazed she shot a quick glance over the auditorium no one but herself and the woman in the rear seemed to have noticed anything unusual again her eyes went back to the stage and then as if a hazy idea in the back of her mind had all at once leaped into dazzling clarity she bent abruptly toward her father dad look she whispered tensely tugging at his sleeve don't you see it's she stopped shrugged a little and her hand drooped limply to her knee the fall of the curtain and the flare-up of the lights seemed to have blotted out an illusion mr hardwick gray and lean and looking rather uncomfortable in his full dress suit adjusted his glasses on his thin nose and looked at her gravely my goodness child what is the matter he murmured nothing dad i forgot that that you wouldn't understand she drew the palm of her hand across her forehead isn't the air stifling too much excitement for you i am afraid he smiled as if his practical sense had found a satisfactory answer your mother was just like that whenever she got a bit wrought up she always said things that i couldn't understand now 
the hangings parted and Vincent Starr stepped inside the box. Helen gave him a swiftly appraising glance. His face was flushed and he looked tired, as if his last ounce of energy had been spent in the emotional tempest of Marius. But a swift look of animation brightened his face as she introduced her father. The first thing one usually noticed about Vincent Starr was his pale, placid eyes. They seemed to give the lie to his magnetic smile, his vivacious manners, and his deep and perfectly modulated voice. As once or twice before in his presence, Helen felt fascinated and repelled. "'You are doing my daughter a great honor," murmured Mr. Hardwick. "'Not at all!' Starr laughed softly, but Helen thought she detected a slight discord that might have been due to either nervousness or fatigue. "'Miss Hardwick has placed me under a very great obligation. Her play is splendid. The last act is particularly strong, as you will see in a few minutes. You must give me your opinion of—' Helen heard no more. She had glanced toward the rear of the house, just in time to see a mysterious smile on the face of the woman seated in the last row. In vain, Helen tried to read and interpret it. Presently, the woman took a pencil from her bag and began to write on a page torn from her program. Finally, she summoned an usher, handed him what she had written, and nodded in the direction where Helen was sitting. The attendant glided away, and a few moments later he stood bowing before Star. "'A lady sent you this, sir,' he announced. Star murmured an apology to Helen and her father, and unfolded the note. His face, dark and almost effeminately smooth, the face of a dreamer rather than a man of action, showed a look of boredom hinting that he was weary of receiving notes from feminine admirers. Then, as he glanced at the writing, his expression suddenly changed. A look of fear crossed his face, but it vanished so quickly that Helen could not be sure she had read its meaning correctly. He crumpled the note in his hand and glanced at his watch. "'It's almost time for the curtain,' he murmured, quite himself once more. I hope to see both of you later." With that he was gone. Helen stole a glance at the woman in the rear. Her face bore an expression of amusement and sly triumph, but it afforded no clue to what the note had contained. Then the lights faded out and the curtain rose upon the final act. The scene depended for its full effect on almost total darkness and the only illumination in the house was a smoldering campfire in one corner of the stage and the small red lights over the exits. Marius stood in the center, almost totally wrapped in shadows, and in the distance were heard the strains of strange, wild singing. The spirits of evil were creeping out of the darkness to make their last sorceress appeal. Helen felt herself tingling with suspense. She did not know why, unless it was due to the look of fear she had seen in Starr's face as he read the note. She glanced toward the rear, but the auditorium was now so dark that she could no longer see the mysterious woman, although she imagined her hair ornament was gleaming dully in the gloom. Of a sudden she opened her eyes wide, straining her pupils against the darkness. She could not be quite sure but she thought a shadow had emerged from one of the exits, and was gliding silently toward the woman in the rear. She sat very still while little shivers ran up and down her back, and she was vaguely wondering at an odd change in Star's voice. It drooped, grew hoarse and uncertain, and there were pauses between the words. She felt he was trying to conquer a sense of unreasoning dread. A feeling of dizziness seized her, but her imagination formed a picture of a dark shape stealing softly, silently toward where the woman sat. Acting on an irresistible impulse, 
she rose and hurried from the box, deaf to her father's mild remonstrance. Without volition on her part, her feet seemed to carry her swiftly up the heavily carpeted aisle. She heard a jumble of noises in her head and felt a tightening at the throat. She rounded the last tier of seats and rushed forward, guided only by a feeble red gleam over one of the exits. A dim shape, a shade darker than the surrounding dusk, was moving a few feet ahead of her. All at once, as if the hesitancy of Starr's voice had cast a deadening spell over the actors and the audience, an uneasy silence fell upon the house. Helen sensed it as she sped along in the wake of the creeping shadow. A few steps more, and she could make out the woman's figure, vaguely outlined against the gloom, and just behind it stood the shadowy shape whose furtive moments Helen had followed since she left the box. The happenings of the next few moments were like a swift, horrible dream. Suddenly she felt limp and cold. Within reach of her arm a hand moved, and the motion seemed to strike a hideous note through the surrounding stillness. A cry rose and died in her throat. She staggered back against a post and stood there motionless while a dark shape brushed past her. She recoiled as a hand touched hers in passing, and she caught a fleeting but unforgettable glimpse of a face. It was gone in a moment, but the swarthy features, framed by coarse black hair that reached to the shoulders, the flat, short nose, the thick and jutting lower lip, the great eyes with their lambent flames that seemed to send streaks of fire into the darkness, gave her a feeling that something evil and loathsome had passed. CHAPTER Two, MR. SHEA For a moment longer she leaned against the pillar. Then she heard laughter, laughter that was low and sibilant, and edged with the insinuating twang that sometimes characterizes the laughter of a madman. It was soft and gentle, yet she thought it was the most fearful sound she had ever heard. It gripped and shook her, and she knew instinctively that it came from the woman in the rear. Something urged her forward, but her nerves and limbs rebelled. Others beside herself must have heard that soul-shaking laughter, for the hush that had fallen over the house ended abruptly in a jumble of loud sounds. The curtain descended with a rhythmic chugging, there were exclamations of surprise and horror, and the audience sprang from their seats as the lights went on. With startled faces they looked to left and right and rear, and several of them excitedly inquired what had happened. No one seemed to know but as if moved by a single impulse they scrambled in the direction whence the laughter came then they stopped huddled in a half circle and stared what they saw seemed all the stranger by contrast with the flowery scents in the air and the rich and brilliant hues of the surroundings all eyes were fixed on the woman whose peculiar demeanor had aroused helen's interest her extravagant attire and her wild, gypsy-like beauty seemed typical of the oddly assorted characters who made up Vincent Starr's circle of intimates. A filmy drapery embroidered with gold-touched flowers hung like an iridescent fog over her gown of silver tissue. Her bare arm was flung out over the top of the next seat, and her head had fallen back against the elbow. Murmurs of awe and consternation fell from the lips of the onlookers. Before their eyes the pallor of death was creeping into the woman's face, and her cheeks and forehead were beaded with the perspiration of the death struggle. Now and then her figure writhed with a slow, snake-like motion. A film of gray was gradually dimming the luster of the eyes. Only the lips were still red. As if to fling a taunt in the face of approaching death, the woman was laughing. 
It sounded wildly unreal and fantastic, and the spectators stood as if gripped by an unearthly enchantment. It seemed as though the woman's spirit was flitting away on waves of hysterical mirth. The sounds grew husky, then ceased. The woman's glazing orbs looked out over the fringe of faces. A fluttering ray struggled with the blinding film before her eyes, and she seemed to be looking for someone who was not there. She stirred as if trying to gather her waning energies. Her lips trembled, a few faint sounds broke on the tense silence, and again her gaze strayed gropingly over the crowd. "'Mr. Mr. Shea,' she whispered. Those closest to her recoiled as from a physical blow. The name spoken by the dying woman had contributed the final touch of weirdness to the scene. The two words went from mouth to mouth in a succession of solemn whispers. Faces turned rigid and white, and men and women looked at one another with mute fear in their eyes. Then someone with more presence of mind than the others suggested calling a physician. A strain of drawling laughter from the dying woman mocked the proposal. It rose to a shrill pitch, then died abruptly in a low sing-song moan that was like a chant of death. The lips were still moving, but the onlookers knew, even without the sagging of the body and the broken light in the eyes, that the woman was dead. A spell seemed to have lifted, and an oppressive essence appeared to have gone out of the air. "'Awful!' wailed a woman, edging away from her place in the huddled throng. "'I shall hear that laugh as long as I live. And what was that she said about Mr. Shea?' The name and the prefix were all anyone had been able to make out, but they had been enough to send a thrill of fear and astonishment through the crowd. Of the mysterious Mr. Shea, little was known, except that he was a versatile and a very elusive criminal, with a penchant for deep scheming and spectacular tactics, and that so far the police had matched their wits against him in vain. He flashed in and out like a meteor, without leaving trace or clue, and his audacity and impudence were as dumbfounding as the magnitude of his exploits. "'Did she mean,' inquired someone, "'that Mr. Shea was here, that she saw him?' "'What else could she have meant?' The speaker cast an uncertain glance at the dead woman. The grayness and the rigidity of her features clashed bizarrely with the brilliant coloring of her gown. "'Likely as not, Mr. Shea murdered her. "'But there is no wound. "'And she made no outcry.' She only laughed, and such a laugh! I can hear it still. Mr. Shea is diabolically clever, observed another, and he goes about his business in his own way. It would be quite in character for him to kill without inflicting a wound, and to let his victim go to her death laughing. The group fell silent. Helen, who had remained in the background, trying to control her sense of horror while she pondered what she had seen, touched the arm of the woman in front. "'Who is she?' she inquired. "'Don't you know?' The woman, busying herself with a vial of smelling salts, gave Helen a puzzled look. "'Why, she is Virginia Darrow. Never attend her studio parties? That's strange.' but i forget that you are something of a stranger among us miss hardwick helen smiled faintly and the next moment her attention was attracted to her father mr hardwick had joined his daughter shortly after the lights went on and until now he had been a silent spectator with difficulty he elbowed his way through the crowd to the dead woman's side and regarded her closely Presently he raised her right arm, which had hung limply at her side. Just above the elbow was a small, faint discoloration, not unlike the puncture made by a hypodermic syringe. 
he nodded thoughtfully and seemed about to speak but just then vincent starr followed by several members of his company came up the aisle and wedged a path through the huddled spectators he seemed to take in everything at a single comprehensive glance he was pale and his fingers trembled but helen noticed that he had taken pains to arrange his attire before coming out to ascertain the cause of the commotion his long and glossy hair was neatly combed his cravat was carefully adjusted and just the proper width of cuff showed beyond the edge of his sleeve she watched him narrowly while he questioned those about him somehow she sensed that it was in keeping with vincent starr's character to be squeamish about the minor details of his appearance even when face to face with a tragedy suddenly as she heard him issue orders to right and left she remembered the note virginia darrow had sent him and she wondered without knowing exactly why whether he would say anything about it at the same time she was forced to admire his quickness of wits and the ease with which he mastered his feelings in an incredibly short time the police had been notified of the occurrence and the doorkeepers had been given orders to allow no one to leave the building star in his habitually suave tones asked his guest to be seated and expressed his regrets that such an unpleasant affair should have taken place under the roof of the thelma there would be an investigation and a great deal of questioning he explained but it would be only a formality if the mysterious mr shea he smiled queerly as he spoke the name had invaded the thelma he would undoubtedly be caught the crowd scattered among the seats in the auditorium and lapsed into the small talk with which one sometimes masks an inward turbulence helen seated beside her father on a lounge in a corner let her glance roam aimlessly over the scene she supposed she would be questioned along with the others and she wondered how much or how little she would be able to tell now that she tried to clarify the confusion in her mind she saw that during the evening she had received two sets of impressions both had been equally strong at the time but now they seemed to clash and quarrel with each other and one of them had all but vanished with the drop of the curtain yet she felt it was the more important one of the two the other had to do with the face she had glimpsed in the shadows with the varicolored lights glowing on all sides her recollection of it seemed unreal and fanciful it appeared to be a thing of darkness and dreams her one remaining impression of it was a sense of malignity and horror she felt words were inadequate to describe it she shrugged her shoulders slightly as if to banish harassing thoughts and turned to her father his face was drawn and a trifle pale and she remembered the family physician had once said something about an incipient heart ailment and the necessity of avoiding excitement she tilted her face close to his i'm sorry i got you into this dad she said mr hardwick drew himself up his face brightened with affection and the pride of parenthood as he gazed at his daughter's figure straight and slender and strong as the trunk of a young birch her simple frock of white taffeta with touches of coral at the waist possessed that subtle individual charm which fashion designers can only imitate her dark loosely coiled hair with stray wisps caressing her healthily tanned cheeks seemed in constant mutiny against the petty tyrannies of hairdressers i might have known something was to happen mr hardwick's tones were gently playful as if he were anxious to turn his daughter's thoughts from the tragedy something always happens where you are you are a storm petrel my dear i was born under uranus you know that explains everything she smiled whimsically 
there was a touch of the child in the firm oval of her face and the smooth curves of mouth and nose but the deep brown eyes held a surprising store of worldly wisdom she quite baffled her father at times the impulses of april and june seemed to be constantly clashing within her and they filled his autumnal days with a never-ending round of surprises i wonder he said eyeing her curiously as a new thought came to him whether uranus had anything to do with your leaving the box just before before it happened it's always safe to blame uranus she parried he is such a convenient scapegoat i don't know what i would do if she was grateful for the interruption that came just then the law was already at work and she sat back and watched the swift precision of its mechanism two policemen one heavy and red-faced the other lean and sharp visaged walked into the theatre and stationed themselves beside the body with the air of zealots guarding the coffin of mohammed she gathered from the few words they exchanged with star that a cordon had been thrown around the building a minute and a half after the call reached the precinct station they were followed shortly by a puffy little man who let it be known that he was a deputy from the office of the chief medical examiner the latter had barely begun the usual inspection of the body when two other men entered the auditorium one of them barrel-chested and somewhat pompous in his manners seemed to be a representative of the district attorney's office the other angular and as loose-jointed as a marionette with lazy cinnamon-colored eyes and a complexion that seemed to indicate that he drank too much coffee and smoked too many cigars was recognized by helen at first glance uranus had brought them together once before she remembered that his name was lieutenant culligore and that he was attached to the homicide squad of the detective bureau as his glance flitted slowly over the room his mind seemed to register each detail without slightest effort helen noticed that he gazed at her a trifle longer than the others but his face betrayed no recognition then began the questioning conducted by the stout man from the district attorney's office while lieutenant culligore made an occasional jotting in his notebook the members of the audience were interrogated briefly and pointedly and each one in turn was permitted to depart after leaving his or her name and address helen marveled at the matter-of-factness of it all it seemed almost ruthless this volleying of questions over a body which was scarcely cold but she recognized the brisk efficiency with which the procedure was carried out none of the witnesses had much to tell that was significant and the only important points brought out were the dying woman's strange laugh and her mention of mr shea culligore as was his habit when impressed curled up his lip under the tip of his nose when these facts were stated and the stout man raised his brows and nodded grimly looks as though mr shea had been up to another of his little tricks he muttered culligore pursed his lips and chewed a dead cigar there was a slow twinkle in his eyes which seemed to say that life wasn't quite so serious as it seemed despite the sordid and ugly affairs with which he came in daily touch helen did not know how it happened but the house was almost empty when her turn to be questioned came her face showed no sign of the trepidation she felt as she stepped forward she knew as she turned her face toward the stout man that three pairs of eyes were watching her with more than ordinary intentness her father's lieutenant culligore's and vincent starr's the stout man gave her a listless look as he inquired her name and address she fancied he was sniffing inwardly and that after looking her over he had decided that she probably could give no information beside what had already been brought out at any rate his questions were few and perfunctory 
and gave her no opportunity to practice the evasion she had mentally rehearsed while the others were being questioned. As she turned away, she saw a mildly reproachful look in her father's face and one of amused understanding in Culligore's. "'Well, doctor?' The stout man turned on the medical examiner, whose rubicund face wore a puzzled scowl. "'What do you make of it?' The examiner wagged his head. Being a man of science, he was strongly averse to forming hasty conclusions. "'There is an abrasion on the right arm that might have been caused by a hypodermic syringe,' he announced. "'And the laugh! How do you account for that?' "'I am not accounting for it, but there are certain drugs that produce exhilaration and laughter.' Most of them have to be taken into the system by inhalation, however, in order to produce such an effect. I see. The stout man looked a bit impatient. In plain words, then, it's a case of murder? I wouldn't say that. It might prove a far-fetched guess. All squibbling aside, don't the scratch on her arm look as though somebody had shot a dose of poison into her with a needle? The examiner pondered. It could mean that, but it doesn't necessarily follow. An autopsy will be necessary to establish the exact cause of death. Why should a murderer use a hypodermic injection when there are so many simpler and easier ways of accomplishing the same result? The stout man guffawed. Mr. Shea never picks the simple and easy way. When he wants to pull off a crime, he always dresses it up in flossy trimmings. And he always plays safe. Now, my idea is that the safest thing in the world to kill a person with is a hypodermic syringe. It makes no noise, there's no smoke, no bullet, no powder marks, no anything, and it doesn't leave any clues behind. The examiner smiled skeptically as if he had his own views on the subject. "'The autopsy will tell. What I fail to understand is why you seem so certain that Mr. Shea, as he calls himself, has had a hand in this affair.' "'Miss Darrow saw him, didn't she?' "'She called out his name, if I understand the witnesses correctly, but she did not say she had seen him. It's possible she imagined she saw him.' The same drugs that produce exhilaration and laughter also produce hallucinations. However, and he pulled a cigar from his pocket and lighted it carefully, whether Miss Darrow did or did not see Mr. Shea is for you gentlemen to decide. Good night. He strode out. The stout man made a wry face and stroked his chin. Evidently, the medical man had given him something to think about. Helen, too, had found food for reflections in the doctor's statement. She stood beside her father a few feet from the others. She had remained for no other reason than a feeling that Culligore, who had been watching her covertly from time to time, might try to detain her if she made a move to go. She believed the lieutenant had rightly guessed that she had not told all she knew. Starr, who had unobtrusively slipped out of the building while the late colloquy was in progress, returned with the report that he had questioned the doorkeepers and the watchmen, and that they had seen no suspicious-looking characters about the place. They were positive no one had entered or left the building, either before or after Miss Darrow's death. Starr ended by inquiring whether it were not possible that the murderer, granting that Miss Darrow had been murdered, was still hiding in the building. The stout man rather scouted the suggestion, but he instructed the two uniformed officers to make a thorough search. "'If this is Mr. Shea's job, you can bet your sweet life he's made a safe getaway,' he grumbled. He probably sneaked out through one of the fire exits. The two policemen withdrew. Starr, gliding about with the softness of a panther, 
found a piece of drapery and covered the body. Helen's lids contracted as she followed his movements. It struck her as odd that during the entire questioning he had made no reference to the communication Miss Darrow had sent him a few minutes before her death. She wondered whether he had forgotten it or was deliberately withholding it. In the latter case, what could be his reason? "'How about the motive?' suggested Lieutenant Collagor. It was one of the few times he had spoken since the investigation began. "'Know of anybody who could have had a reason for getting Miss Darrow out of the way, Mr. Starr?' Starr stood for a moment with head lowered, deep in thought. Then he slowly shook his finely proportioned head. "'No, I don't. I knew Miss Darrow quite well. As far as I am aware, she had no enemies. I can't imagine why—' He checked himself. Then he gaped, and his eyes widened, and he looked as though an important matter had just occurred to him. Finally, with a sheepish smile, he began to search his pockets. "'This dreadful affair has upset me completely,' he murmured. And then, as if in answer to the question that had flashed through Helen's mind a few moments before, he produced a crumpled piece of paper. "'If I had not been so flustered, I should have shown you this at once,' he added. He smoothed out the message and handed it to the stout man. The latter's face clouded as he read it aloud. Mr. Shea, like a fool, rushes in where angels might fear to tread. V.D. A pause followed the reading. Culligore's upper lip brushed the tip of his nose, a sign that he had found a problem to ponder. A blank expression came into the stout man's face. He looked bewilderedly at Starr. "'What do you suppose she meant by that?' he asked. "'That's just what I wondered when the note was brought me,' explained Starr, a blend of sadness and self-reproach in his tones. "'Miss Darrow was a strange woman, full of subtleties and queer whims. The note startled me at first, then I decided it was only a jest. At any rate, it was time for the curtain, and I dismissed the matter from my mind.' Now, in the light of what has happened, I can see it was meant as a warning. Warning? echoed the stout man. Undoubtedly. Starr gazed regretfully into space. In some manner, Miss Darrow must have become aware that Mr. Shea was in the house, and she chose this method of warning me of his presence. I was a fool not to see it. He paced back and forth, running his fingers through his thick hair and muttering self-reproaches. The stout man looked as if he were trying to untangle a mental knot. Again he read the note. "'If Miss Dara wanted to tip you off that Mr. Shea was in the house, why didn't she say so in plain words?' "'Facetiousness,' said Starr grimly. Virginia Darrow was the kind of woman you would expect to be facetious at her own funeral. Why didn't I realize that she was trying to warn me? I remember now that she behaved in a peculiar manner all evening. Whenever I happened to look in her direction, I found her gazing at me in a strange way. I didn't understand then, but I suppose now that she was trying to send me an ocular message. When that failed, she sent me the note. Oh, why didn't I... He made a gesture of distress and self-disgust. Helen, watching his every movement, remembered that it was Miss Darrow's odd way of staring at Star that had first attracted her attention to the woman. The recollection started a train of new thoughts, but Culligore's voice interrupted it. "'If Miss Dara was right and Mr. Shea was in the house,' he told the fat man, "'then you and I might as well hand in our badges and look for new jobs.' The other jerked up his head. 
"'You don't think that—' he began in startled tones, then broke off and grinned complacently. "'Not a chance of that. Mr. Shea couldn't have been in the audience. I gave all of them a pretty stiff quiz, and everyone gave a good account of himself. Anyhow, they're the kind that get their names and pictures into the society columns of the Sunday papers. A bunch of harmless nuts, that's all.' He looked at Starr, as if realizing that the epithet had been a trifle brusque, but the manager seemed amused rather than offended. "'I think you are right,' he murmured. "'The audience was composed of invited guests. I am willing to vouch for every one of them. Furthermore, you have their names and addresses, and you can communicate with them whenever you wish. If Mr. Shea was really in the theater, he came here as an unbidden guest. In all likelihood, he stole in while the house was dark during the first scene of the last act, and departed as soon as he had accomplished his purpose. It sounded plausible enough, Helen thought, yet her mind was heavy with a giddying whirl of suspicions and contradictions. She slanted a reluctant glance toward the chair containing the body. With a shiver, she turned away, and a look at her father's drawn and tired face warned her that he should be in bed. Then she glanced at the man from the district attorney's office, and finally at Culligore. His face was a mask, but his occasional glances in her direction troubled her. The two uniformed officers had not yet returned from their search, and she wondered what they would have to report. Once more her eyes flitted over the little group, and then, with a suddenness that choked a cry in her throat, everything was blotted from sight. In a twinkling, impenetrable darkness had descended upon the house. Somewhere a door banged. She felt her father's tightening clutch on her arm. The stout man swore. Dark shapes were darting hither and thither. She heard a fragmentary cry, followed by a crash and a succession of thuds. A thrust sent her sprawling to the floor, and her mind drifted into a state of semi-stupor, during which she was conscious of nothing but the swift and silent movements of the shadowy shapes. Voices and the return of light jolted her mind back to consciousness. She struggled to her feet and blinked her eyes at the strange scene. Her father, dazed but apparently unharmed, sat a short distance away, with his back to the wall. The stout man, seemingly unconscious, lay in a twisted heap on the floor. Culligore was staring about him groggily and muttering something about a blow on the head. A policeman, one of the pair who had been sent off to search the house, was helping Starr to his feet. With the attention to detail that comes in moments of great bewilderment, Helen noticed that Starr made a ludicrous picture. His attire, so faultless and immaculate a few minutes ago, was now in a sorry state of disorder. A streak of crimson stained his shirt front and he held a handkerchief to his nose. He wobbled drunkenly across the floor, but all at once his figure stiffened and a blank look came into his face. His lips formed unspoken words as he raised a finger and pointed toward a seat in the last tier. As she followed the pointing finger, things swam in confusion before Helen's eyes. Star speechless and crestfallen, was indicating the chair where the body of Virginia Darrow had been. As she stared stonily toward the empty chair, Helen felt an impulse to cry out. She came a few steps closer, then stopped with a shudder and dazedly swept her hand across her forehead. "'It's... it's gone!' she cried huskily. Chapter Three, Helen Equivocates. 
Across the breakfast table Mr. Hardwick looked anxiously at his daughter. The wild rose color that usually flooded her cheeks had faded a trifle since last night, and her eyes were less bright. Most of the time the curator's mind browsed among relics of the past, but his perceptions were amazingly keen where his daughter was concerned. "'Mr. Shea gave us quite a shock last night,' he remarked. Helen kept her eyes down while she poured his coffee and added two and a half lumps of sugar and the usual portion of cream. Then she stirred it for him, knowing he would be quite apt to forget to do so himself. Despite the half-dozen titles bestowed upon him by universities and learned societies, she felt he needed looking after. "'Don't forget that you have a lecture engagement this afternoon,' she admonished as she passed the cup across the table. Mr. Hardwick nodded and sipped. "'It is a most extraordinary case. The murder of that poor woman, assuming that it was a case of murder, seemed wholly unprovoked. I gathered from the conversation among the officers that no motive was in evidence. It looks like a wanton, despicable crime.' Helen crumbled a piece of toast. "'Professor Warburton is coming to see you at three this afternoon. "'I have a memorandum of the appointment on my desk.' "'Mr. Hardwick smiled faintly. "'Our minds seem to be pulling in opposite directions this morning. "'This Mr. Shea interests me. "'He appears to be a remarkable criminal. "'His audacity and the originality of his methods are unparalleled.' I don't know that I ever encountered anything quite so mystifying as the circumstances surrounding the murder last night. How the murderer went in and out without being seen is beyond understanding, and the subsequent removal of the body was the most amazing part of it all. There seems to be neither method nor reason in that. One thing appears certain. Mr. Shea could not have accomplished what he did unless he had been aided by accomplices. What do you think, my dear?" Helen's head was lowered over her coffee cup. The captive sunlight in her hair gleamed and flashed. "'Your extra pair of glasses are at the opticians,' she reminded him. "'Don't forget to stop for it.' Mr. Hardwick looked at her helplessly. Then carefully, and from force of habit, he folded his napkin. "'I wonder whether the police will ever learn Mr. Shea's identity,' he murmured musingly. "'So far the scoundrel has contrived to mystify them completely, but some day his egotism and love of self-gratification are apt to cause his undoing. In the meantime, however, he is likely to do a great deal of mischief. The fellow's effrontery is colossal and his fearlessness and brains render him most dangerous. In some respects, he bears a very close resemblance to that other notorious rogue, now reported to be in retirement. Helen drew a quick breath. She bent her head a little lower over her cup. Her right index finger traced a design on the tablecloth. "'Another cup of coffee, Dad?' was her only reply. Mr. Hardwick appeared not to have heard. "'You know who I mean, the man they used to call the Grey Phantom. For several years he was regarded as one of the cleverest and most dangerous criminals the world has ever known.' Slowly Helen raised her head. Her eyes, as they met her father's, were steady and bright. "'That was because the world didn't understand him,' she said with emphasis. The gray phantom wasn't really a criminal. He was only a, a sort of human dynamo whose energy happened to be turned in the wrong direction. Isn't that a distinction without a difference? A Robin Hood is an enemy of society, despite the glamour with which he surrounds himself. However, and Mr. Hardwick's face softened quickly, I am deeply in the gray phantom's debt. He saved your life twice, and, but for him, I would now be a lonely and heartbroken old man. 
Helen nodded eagerly. And the Assyrian collection, Dad. You spent most of your life gathering it, and you were almost overcome with grief when it was stolen. The gray phantom risked his life and liberty in order to recover it and restore it to you. He wouldn't have done that if he had been just an ordinary criminal. True, admitted Mr. Hardwick. I shall be under obligations to the gray phantom as long as I live. The man has a number of excellent qualities, whatever may be said of his past. On the whole, it is not surprising that you have taken an interest in him. Helen's eyes were lowered again. There was a mingling of tenderness and worry in Mr. Hardwick's face as he looked at her. "'I know just how you feel,' he said softly. "'A man who is trying to live down a dark past always exerts a strong romantic appeal on a woman of your impressionable age. I don't know why it is, unless it pleases her to think he is doing it for her sake. It makes me think of your play, The Master of His Soul. All last night, until the interruption came, I was wondering whether your Marius was not the gray phantom. Helen sat rigidly still for a moment. Then her lips began to twitch. She flashed her father a smile. Sometimes, Daddy dear, you show a wonderful understanding of things that have nothing to do with Assyriology. I was right, then. His face sobered. I hope you realize that, despite the gray phantom's admirable qualities, there is a gulf between him and you. But you are just as level-headed as was your mother, and I have no fear that the impulses of your heart will get the better of your judgment. We were discussing Mr. Shea. There seems to be a striking similarity between his methods and those of the gray phantom, except that the latter was never known to stoop to murder. He paused for a moment and studied her averted face. "'You puzzled me last night, dear. You will admit that your conduct was, uh, peculiar.' "'It's getting late, Dad,' murmured Helen, a bit confusedly glancing at her wristwatch. "'You should have been at your office half an hour ago, and this is the first time I've known you to take an interest in a murder case.' Once during the evening you gripped my hand and tried to point out something to me, pursued Mr. Hardwick, heedless of her remark. You spoke incoherently, and I had not the faintest idea what it was about. Then, a minute or so before the tragedy, you left the box and hurried away. Still later, while the officer was questioning you, I felt you were concealing something. Helen, her fingers tightening about a fork handle, shook her head. "'I answered every question he put to me.' "'I know, dear, yet you withheld a secret of some kind from him.' "'Not exactly. I—I I merely refrained from telling him something that—that that I might have told.' "'Something you had heard or seen?' She hesitated for an instant. If I had told all I had seen and heard, I wouldn't have been telling half of what I knew. Mr. Hardwick leaned back against the chair and pondered this cryptic statement. He seemed puzzled rather than hurt by his daughter's evasive answers. Suddenly she looked up, saw the troubled expression in his face, and impulsively pushed back her chair and ran up behind him. Please don't ask me any more questions, Dad. She put her arms around his neck and tilted her face to his. It is true I held something back, but at the time I didn't know why. I merely felt that it wouldn't do to tell. This morning, after lying awake most of the night, I knew I had done the right thing. She gave a little laugh. Isn't it just like a woman to act first and look into her reasons afterward? I, well, I suppose so. And what were your reasons? Would you be hurt if I told you I would rather not explain them just now? No, I trust you. 
experience has taught me that i can depend upon you in spite of your mysterious little ways and madcap pranks there is one thing i wish you would tell me though he stopped fumbling for words was your reticence last night prompted by a wish to shield someone no was her prompt reply and her eyes gazed frankly into his what put such a thought into your head i scarcely know you'll think i am an old fool but it occurred to me that perhaps you had discovered something that led you to think that mr shea and the gray phantom are identical and you thought i was protecting the gray phantom what an idea but you were wrong dad absolutely wrong then i am glad mr hardwick rose and put his arm around her waist my goodness almost ten o'clock and i have been sitting here gossiping like an old woman you have taken a load off my mind dear child i was really worried she laughed whisked a few crumbs from his coat straightened his tie and kissed him and i hope added mr hardwick banteringly that uranus won't lead you into any more foolhardy adventures again she laughed but her face sobered the moment he turned away and left the room a wiser maturer expression settled over the wide-set eyes and the vivid lips it seemed as though her talk with her father had left a disquieting impression in her mind she moved absently about the room setting things in order here and there but the faraway gleam in her eyes told that her mind was scarcely aware of what her hands were doing presently she stopped before the open window and looked out a building was going up across the street and the groaning of derricks and screaming of steam whistles jarred discordantly in the back of her mind near the curb a group of laborers were mixing concrete and a powdery substance was drifting in the air she came out of her abstraction with a little start her eyes were on the window sill and she spelled out the characters she had written in the thin layer of dust g r a y p h a n t o m she mumbled puzzled and somewhat annoyed with herself the faint pencilings in the dust seemed all the stranger because she had not been thinking of the gray phantom instead her mind had been occupied by mr shea and what the morning newspapers had said about the tragedy in the thelma theater the account she had read had been largely speculation and conjecture the dying woman's strange laughter and her mysterious allusion to mr shea had afforded material for columns of vivid and imaginative description the medical examiner had reluctantly admitted that miss darrow's death might have been caused by a poison administered hypodermically but he had added that the symptoms were strange to him and that he knew of no drug producing just such effects a number of toxicologists had been interviewed but they had declared that the few facts at hand were not sufficient to enable them to form an opinion and the disappearance of the body rendered it doubtful whether the cause of death would ever be learned definitely only one thing seemed beyond dispute and that was mr shea's complicity in the affair the elusive and highly accomplished rogue already had a score of astounding crimes to his record and the thelma murder was hedged with all the mystery and baffling detail with which he loved to mask his exploits miss darrow's dying words were scarcely needed to turn the finger of suspicion in mr shea's direction the absence of clues the uncertainty in regard to the motive the audacity that marked the crime itself as well as the subsequent snatching away of the body all indicated a boldness and a finesse that left little doubt of mr shea's guilt even if his own hand had not executed the crime it seemed practically certain that his mind had planned and conceived it 
But who was Mr. Shea? The whole train of surmises and theories pivoted on that question. Not much was known of him, save that he had a passion for tantalizing the public and keeping the nerves of the men at headquarters on edge, and that his achievements had not been equaled in scope or brilliance of execution since the gray phantom's retirement. He took a diabolical delight in flaunting his name before the world while keeping his person carefully out of the reach of the law's long arm, and even the name was a challenge to the police and a teaser for the public imagination. Someone versed in dead languages had discovered that the word Shea was the ancient equivalent of the modern X, the symbol of the unknown quantity, and it was generally agreed that the name fitted the elusive individual who bore it. Yet the name meant nothing. It was only an abstraction, for it afforded no clue to its owner's identity. The night before, while she sat beside her father in the Thelma Theater, a vagrant flash of intuition had come to Helen. She had seen the solution of the mystery in a swift, dazzling glimpse. The revelation had stunned and nearly blinded her, and thoughts had crowded upon her so thickly that she would have been quite unable to clothe them in words. The idea carried to her by that intuitive flash had seemed clear and unquestionable. It still seemed so, but her talk with her father had disturbed her a little and turned her thoughts in a new direction. Again she looked down at the tracings in the dust. A smile, faint and wistful, reflected her softened mood, and a light of wonder and gentleness flooded her eyes. She reached out a hand to obliterate the tell-tale pencilings, but something restrained her. Besides, a freshly forming layer of dust was already blotting them out. The telephone rang in the adjoining room, and she hurried away to answer. "'Miss Hardwick?' inquired a drawling voice which she instantly recognized. "'Lieutenant Culligore speaking. I'm at the Thelma Theater. Wish you'd come over right away. I want to ask you a few questions.' Before she could reply, he hung up. Her face grew suddenly tense. Culligore's brusqueness piqued her, though she knew it was characteristic of the man, and she felt he had taken undue advantage of her by giving her no chance for argument. She did not wish to see him, yet she knew she could not escape him by merely ignoring his request. Anyway, she reflected as she hastily dressed for the street, it would be interesting to learn Culligore's theory of the murder. A ride in the subway and a short walk brought her to the door of the Thelma. On the wall, at each side of the entrance, were posters stating that until further notice there would be no more performances of his soul's master. Helen viewed the announcement of the withdrawal of her play without much regret. She had partly anticipated it, and last night's occurrence had given her weightier things to think of. As she passed through the foyer, a policeman nodded stolidly and in a way that told her she was expected. She passed unhindered into the auditorium. At first she could see nothing. Every door was closed and the vast room was full of silence and vague shadows. Presently, as her eyes grew accustomed to the dusk, she glanced toward the chair that had been occupied by Miss Darrow. She looked quickly aside, and saw that she was standing not far from the pillar that had supported her when the creature with the loathsome face brushed past her. The scene, which had seemed dim and immaterial while she was out in the sunlight a few minutes ago, now recurred to her with disagreeable vividness. Of a sudden, the air about her felt heavy and oppressive. A figure was moving up the aisle toward where she stood. The dawdling gait and the slouchy attitude told her it was Culligore, and she braced her nerves for an ordeal. In a few moments her quickly working wits had found a way of handling the situation. 
"'Good morning, Lieutenant,' she said pleasantly as he came up beside her. "'I suppose you are looking for clues. Any success?' "'Nope,' he replied complainingly. "'That's why I sent for you, Miss—' "'You have found no trace of the body?' she quickly cut in, anxious to maintain the role of questioner. Culligore shook his head. She felt his eyes on her face, though he did not appear to be looking at her. Practicing a trick cultivated by his profession, he was studying her without seeming to do so. "'Don't you think it strange that the murderer should go to all that risk and trouble to remove the body?' she went on. "'Murderer? There must have been three or four of them, at least. There was some mighty fast work done when the lights went out, and one man didn't do it all. I've got a bump in the back of my head as big as a hen's egg. Selfkin, the man from the district attorney's office, is in bed with a fractured skull, and Starr looks as though somebody had hit him on the nose with a brick.' One of the gang must have tampered with the switchboard back of the proscenium arch just before the others swooped down on us and carried away the body. But what was the object? Wasn't the murderer's purpose accomplished with the killing of Miss Darrow? Hard telling. One thing is sure. As long as the body is missing, there can be no autopsy and I'll bet a pair of yellow socks that that's exactly what they wanted. Not that I pretend to understand it all, but it seems reasonable that they didn't care to have the exact cause of Miss Darrow's death become known. Helen pondered this statement for a moment. How about the motive for the murder? We're pretty much in the dark there, too, admitted Culligore. I don't suppose, though, that it was just by accident that Miss Darrow happened to die a few minutes after she had sent Starr a note warning him that Mr. Shea was in the house. "'Oh!' Helen gave a quick start. "'You think she was killed because she had in some manner discovered Mr. Shea's identity?' "'Maybe.' Culligore, with legs spread out and hands in trousers' pockets, seemed engrossed in a study of Helen's bright-trimmed hat. "'My mind isn't made up on that point. Mr. Shea's schemes go pretty deep. Maybe you can tell me—' Again Helen interrupted him. "'Have you discovered how the murderers got in and out of the building?' "'They didn't leave any tracks behind them, but there is a door in the rear of the basement that they might have used.' It's supposed to be locked, but I satisfied myself a while ago that the spring lock can be picked. That the body was carried out that way is as good a guess as any. But look here, Miss Hardwick, and something that might have been a grin drifted across his face. You're pretty good at firing questions, but it's my turn now. She stiffened, seeing she would have to assume defensive tactics. She sent him a quick glance, but his face, always inscrutable, was even more so in the dusk. "'I asked you to come here, hoping the surroundings would refresh your memory of what happened last night,' Culligore went on in his usual placid drawl. "'You needn't repeat what you said then. What I'm after is the things you didn't say.' "'I don't believe I understand.' Culligore's chuckle sounded like a snort, though she knew it was meant to be good-natured. "'Oh, yes, you do. I didn't do much talking last night, but I was watching you all the time. We'd met before, you know, and I could read you like an open book. I knew you were just as long on brains as on looks. Though you answered every question, you weren't telling anything.' All the while you were holding something back, isn't that true?" She hesitated, having an uncomfortable feeling that Culligore was seeing through her and that any attempt at evasion would be useless. "'What do you want to know?' she asked. "'That's a lot better, Miss Hardwick. You might begin by telling me where you were sitting when the disturbance began.' "'Why, I—' 
I wasn't sitting anywhere. Standing up, then? I wasn't standing, either. Oh, I see. You were lying down? No, not even lying down. Kellegore gave her a queer look. If you weren't sitting, standing, or lying, you must have hung suspended in the air. Was that it? Helen smiled engagingly. She had found time for deliberation while quibbling, and now her mind was made up. I was so frightened I could neither stand up nor sit down. I was leaning against that pillar over there. She pointed. How did you happen to leave your seat? Helen told him of the flitting shadow that had caused her to leave her father and run to the rear of the house. And what did you see while you were leaning against the pillar? was Kellegore's next question. Helen searched her mind for words vivid enough to recount her impressions during the terrible moments just before the drop of the curtain, but she felt her description was both hazy and fragmentary. Her picture of the face that had flashed past her in the dark was blurred and unreal, like one's recollection of a dream. When she had done her best, Kellegore walked back and forth for a time. Standing in an attitude of strained tensity, she wondered what his next question would be. Suddenly he stopped squarely in front of her, and again she had an uncomfortable feeling that his deceptively lazy eyes were reading her thoughts. "'What else?' he demanded quietly. "'What you have told me so far is pretty good, but you're still holding back the most important thing, the thing you didn't want to tell about last night.' "'How—how how do you know that?' she asked. He gave another snort-like chuckle. Common horse sense tells me. The reason you didn't tell about the things you saw while leaning against the post was because you were afraid they would lead you on to a subject you didn't want to discuss. You were afraid that if you got started, you might get tangled up and wouldn't be able to stop. Helen could only stare at him. He had stated the truth far more clearly than she herself could have done. "'What was it, Miss Hardwick? I think you had better tell.' She stood silent, twisting her figure this way and that, and all the while wishing that he would take his eyes from her. Jumbled thoughts thronged her mind, and she felt her power of resistance slipping from her. Finally Culligore swung round on his heels, and a sigh of relief escaped her. The thing about you that puzzles me more than anything else is that your hair isn't red, he told her. The rest I can savvy easily enough. I can even tell what it was you were holding back last night. Want me to? His tones were soft and teasing. She squirmed, torn between anxiety and despair. His face was expressionless but she felt he was inwardly laughing at her. "'All right, then,' he said, taking her silence for assent. "'You couldn't have had more than one reason for keeping mum last night, and that reason was that you wanted to shield somebody. There is only one man on earth you could have wanted to shield, and that man is the gray phantom.' "'No!' she cried. "'You're mistaken. I wasn't—' easy now. All at once his tone changed. There's such a thing as protesting too much, you know. I don't take much stock in what I read in the Sunday papers, but there's a lot of talk going the rounds about a romance between you and the gray phantom. Most of it is pipe dreams, I guess. Anyhow, it's nobody's business, and it makes no difference. All I'll say is that if I was the gray phantom, and had a girl like you fighting for me, I'd be willing to go through hellfire for her every day in the week. You're loyal, clean through, and— But you're wrong, she interrupted emphatically. His words filled her with a great fear, but there was a kind of rough tenderness in his voice that warmed her. 
I knew you'd say that, but you have to hear me through. I take off my hat to the gray phantom. He always played the game according to the code, even when he cut those fancy didos that put gray hairs in almost every head on the force. I shouldn't say it, but it goes just the same. The phantom's been lying low now for some time. Nobody seems to know where he is. He's shown himself only twice, and each time he came out in a good cause. They say he's going it straight, and it's rumored that a certain young lady has had a lot to do with his turning over a new leaf. He paused, and for a moment his eyes rested on her averted face. It's hard work for a leopard to change his spots. Some people say it can't be done. The phantom's human, like the rest of us. Maybe he's got tired of the straight and narrow path and gone back to his old tricks under a new name. Just for the sake of argument, we'll say he has. And I've got a hunch that last night you saw or heard something that made you think that Mr. Shea is the gray phantom. The assertion staggered her, though she had known all the time that he was leading up to it. Using almost the same words, her father had expressed the same idea at the breakfast table, and it was the similarity of the phrasing that startled her. No, no, was all she could say. Then will you please tell me, said Culligore, his tones both gentle and insistent, why didn't you come out with what you knew last night? She fell back a step, feeling suddenly weak as she realized that his question was unanswerable. A confusion of ideas churned and simmered in her mind. Her lips moved, but no words came. "'You've answered me,' declared Culligore. "'You think Mr. Shea is the phantom. Maybe you're right, and maybe you're wrong. What I wanted to know was what you thought. And let me tell you something. A foolish grin, one of Lieutenant Culligore's infrequent ones, wrinkled his face. I hate my job less whenever I meet up with one of your kind. Helen did not hear what he said. She felt as if the swirl of thoughts and emotions within her had suddenly turned into a leaden lump. She glanced involuntarily at the chair in which Virginia Darrow had sat and of a sudden she fancied she heard laughter. Slow, tinkling laughter that sounded like a taunt flung in the face of an approaching specter. She knew the sounds existed only in her imagination, but with a low, long, drawn-out cry she turned abruptly and fled toward the door, conscious only of a fierce desire for sunlight and air. No one detained her. She ran across the street. An idea was slowly working its way out of the turmoil in her mind. She opened her bag and counted her scant supply of bills. Then she looked about her. Half a block down the street she saw the sign of a district messenger office. In a few moments she was inside, hastily scrawling a note which she had addressed to her father. A taxicab was passing as she stepped out on the street. She hailed the driver, and he drew in at the curb. "'Erie Station, West 23rd Street,' she directed breathlessly. As the cab started, she slumped back against the cushions and gazed rigidly out the window. Despite the bright sunlight, things blurred before her eyes, and there was only one clear thought in her mind. She was on her way to the gray phantom, for she alone knew where to find him. Chapter 4 Azure Crest It was growing dark when she reached the end of her journey, and the dusk made it easy for her to elude the little knot of idlers on the station platform. With frequent backward glances, she hurried down a path that skirted the edge of a village nestling at the foot of a hill, which was outlined against the horizon like a great funnel-shaped cloud. 
On its apex was Azure Crest, the hermitage of the gray phantom. Helen found the motor driveway that circled its way upward in spiral fashion, for the hill was too steep to permit cars to reach the top by direct route. She had visited the place once before, in the course of one of the perilous adventures she and the phantom had shared together. The residence, a sprawling structure of stone, tile, and stucco, had been built by the phantom shortly after his retirement, and she had marveled at the precautions he had taken to protect his privacy. The inhabitants of the village understood that the place was occupied by a wealthy and leisurely gentleman who was spending the remainder of his life in ease and solitude on the desolate hilltop. Though consumed with curiosity, they never ventured near Azure Crest, guessing accurately that they would not be welcomed. Occasionally they saw one of the servants, but the owner never permitted himself to be seen except by his most intimate associates. The tang of late autumn was in the air, and Helen's head cleared as she walked briskly up the zigzagging driveway. The railway journey had been long and tedious, and punctuated by innumerable stops, and she had been too distracted to think clearly. Now she began to search her mind for a plan, but she soon saw that planning was impossible. Her trip to Azure Crest had been prompted by one of those sudden impulses that usually dictated her conduct, and she had been conscious of no other motive than to put an end to her fears and doubts. She had thought that a talk with the gray phantom would quickly end the suspense. Reaching the gate in the picket fence that encircled the apex of the hill, she touched an electric button. While waiting, she looked about her. The Susquehanna, like a cocoon thread, wound in and out among the hills and valleys in the distance. The moon, shining through a vapory gauze, splashed a misty sheen over boulders and trees. She heard a dog's shrill bark, and a masculine figure came down the graveled walk toward the gate. As he drew nearer and the pale moonlight fell on him, she saw he was stocky and coarse-featured, and she guessed he was one of the sentinels that were always stationed about the place. "'What do you want?' he asked ungraciously as he reached the gate. "'I wish to see Mr. Venardi, she announced, using the name by which the occupant of Azure Crest had been known before he became the Gray Phantom. She thought the man repressed a start, but she reflected that his evident surprise was natural enough, since visitors seldom came to Azure Crest. "'Mr. Venardi, eh?' He drew an instrument from his pocket and flashed an electric gleam in her face. For a long moment he studied her in silence. "'You mean the gray phantom?' "'Yes.' He hesitated, still searching her face in the light of the electric flash. It was plain that the appearance of a feminine visitor at the gate of Azure Crest had aroused his suspicion. "'What do you want to see him about?' he demanded gruffly. "'Tell him Miss Hardwick wishes to see him. I think that will be sufficient.' She drew herself up as she spoke and regarded him steadily. As if decided by her cool and level tones, the man lowered the light and turned away, and in a few moments he had been swallowed by the shadows cast by the tall trees. Helen controlled her impatience. She understood that the gray phantom was obliged to exercise care every moment of his life. Despite his new mode of existence, he was still an outlaw in the eyes of the police, and a number of outstanding charges made it necessary for him to observe every precaution. Again the man emerged out of the shadows. This time he said nothing, but peered at her furtively as he opened the gate and motioned her to step through. He closed and locked the gate carefully, then walked ahead of her up the graveled walk. A great shaggy dog slouched at his heels and wagged its tail energetically, as if disturbed by the arrival of a visitor. Helen's guide stopped under the portico and opened a door. 
a dim light shone on his face as he turned and told her to enter, and his expression gave her a twinge of misgiving. She tried in vain to analyze it, and the next moment the disturbing impression was gone. "'Wait,' he said, indicating a chair. Helen felt relieved as soon as the door closed behind him. The room was large and pleasant, and the oak-paneled, cream-colored walls made an attractive background for the furniture and decorations. Each little detail suggested the gray phantom's instinctive taste for beauty and proportion, and it suddenly occurred to her that this was the same room in which he had received her on her previous visit to Azure Crest. Footfalls sounded in the hall, and all at once she grew confused. She wondered how she was to broach the subject that had been in her thoughts constantly since last night. She started to rise as the door opened, but in the next instant she sat back and swallowed an exclamation of surprise. She had expected to see the gray phantom, but the person who entered was a short, slightly humpbacked man of about fifty. He jerked his head toward her by way of a bow, and as he smiled she noticed that his mouth was crooked. "'My name is Hawks,' he announced in soft, lisping accents. "'I am the secretary. I understand you wish to see Mr. Venardi. Have you an appointment with him?' A faint touch of uneasiness mingled with Helen's impatience. The gray phantom had never mentioned that he had a secretary and she doubted whether he was in the habit of making appointments. "'I have no appointment,' she said, mastering her vexation and disquietude. "'But I think Mr. Venardi will see me if you mention my name.' "'Ah, then you are a friend of his?' "'I have met him several times.' "'To be sure,' said the little man. He rubbed his hands which seemed abnormally large for one of his sparse stature. But if you know anything at all about Mr. Venardi, you must realize that he has to exercise caution, particularly in regard to the people he meets. Helen rose, a faint flush of indignation in her cheeks. The next moment she sat down again, for she realized that Hawks's argument was reasonable. The gray phantom's existence was precarious enough to warrant every conceivable precaution. "'I know Mr. Venardi will see me if you tell him who I am,' she declared, looking straight into the little man's eyes. "'Quite likely. But I have orders, and I dare not disregard them. Be good enough to answer one or two questions. To begin with, what is the nature of your business with Mr. Venardi? Helen's patience was almost exhausted, but her sense of humor came to her rescue. Her lips began to twitch. "'Tell Mr. Venardi,' she said, "'that the subject I wish to discuss with him has to do with a certain Mr. Shea.' The little man's eyes opened wide. She fancied his hand shook a trifle as he made an annotation on the pad he carried. "'Quite so.' he murmured, quickly controlling himself. "'You have come here on business connected with a certain Mr. Shea. Just one more question. Very few people know there is such a place as Azure Crest. How did you happen to find it?' "'Mr. Venardi once gave me the directions. But you are exerting yourself needlessly, Hawks. I am sure all that is necessary is to mention my name to Mr. Venardi.' "'Perhaps so.' The humpback made another annotation on the pad, after which he put it in his pocket. "'I'll repeat to Mr. Venardi what you have just told me.' He walked out of the room. Helen could not tell why, but the silence that fell upon the room as the door closed impressed her uncomfortably. She did her best to muffle a faint inward whisper of warning, a premonition that something was wrong. Hawks's questions had left a train of disturbing thoughts in her mind. She waited a few minutes, then got up and began to pace the floor in an effort to quell a rising nervousness. 
she glanced at the pictures on the walls but they did not seem to be the same as those that had hung there on her last visit and they failed to interest her presently she stepped to the window and looked out the trees were nodding drowsily in the gentle night wind the mist rising from the lowlands on all sides of the hill gave her a curious sense of remoteness from the world then she drew back a step suddenly someone was passing the window and she caught a momentary glimpse of a face for a second or two a pair of large and oddly piercing eyes were fixed on her then the figure vanished but the vision left her white and shaken a hoarse cry rose to her lips unless her imagination had deceived her the face that had just passed the window was the same swarthy loathsome face she had seen in the thelma theater scarcely twenty-four hours ago seized with a great fear she ran across the floor and opened the door the face with its squatty features and long black hair fluttering in the breeze had crystallized all the vague misgivings she had felt since she entered the house for the moment she was unable to think but an unreasoning impulse to flee drove her swiftly down the long hall she felt she must escape from azure crest at once she had nearly reached the end of the hall when she came to a dead stop she stood rigid listening somewhere a laugh sounded the staccato accents seemed to fill the house with volumes of hideous sound each vibrant note conjured up a fearful picture before her eyes she staggered back against the wall stopping her ears to shut out a repetition of the sound but the echoes of it lingered in her imagination she knew the laugh well it was the same kind of laugh that virginia darrow had taken with her into eternity chapter five perplexities minutes passed each dragging a train of monstrous fancies before helen's mental vision the tip of her fingers shut out all sounds from her ears but the laughter still dinned and echoed in her imagination. It reminded her of the haunting strains of glee that had come from Virginia Darrow's dying lips. Somehow this laughter was different, but the difference was so subtle that she could but vaguely sense it. It was loud and delirious in contrast to the gentle, dirge-like notes that had characterized the other. She could stand the suspense no longer sped on by fear she ran in the direction where she thought the door was she brought up against a stairway instead a noise caused her to lift her head down the stairs lurching and sliding came a woman her hair was wildly tousled and her clothing in disorder and peal after peal of harsh laughter cut through the silence as she scurried down the steps then she saw helen and she stopped as abruptly as if she had dashed in against a material barrier clutching the railing with one hand she wagged drunkenly from side to side her face was ashen but her skin was clear and smooth as a young girl's the eyes unnaturally wide and bright stared down at helen with fierce intensity she had ceased laughing but the lips were still agape as if suddenly frozen into rigidity helen forgot her fears as she saw the strange look in the woman's face she wondered whether it meant madness terror or intoxication it seemed to be neither but rather a blending of all three slowly with the outspread fingers of one hand pressing against her breast the woman came down the remaining steps her great eyes were still fixed on Helen, but the mad flame in the depths was gradually yielding to a look of sanity. "'What are you doing here?' she demanded. Her voice was dry, and she spoke with little hissing sounds, as if each word were exhausting her breath. Helen winced as the woman clutched her arm. Streaks of gray in the tumbled masses of her black hair clashed sharply with her youthfully rounded face, 
and Helen guessed that the contrast had been brought about by some terrifying experience. "'Do you know where you are?' the woman went on, tightening her grip on Helen's arm. "'This is Azurecrest, isn't it?' Helen's words voiced an indefinite doubt that had been stirring faintly in the back of her mind since she saw the face at the window. "'I came here to see the gray—' to see Mr. Venardi. "'Azure Crest?' The woman's mind seemed to be slowly struggling out of a daze. "'Yes, that's what they call the place. But there is no Mr. Venardi here. You have been deceived, just as I was. Those monsters! Do you know what will happen to you if you remain here?' Helen shrugged, as if to fight off a stupor that seemed to be gradually enfolding body and mind. "'They'll inject the fever into your veins,' the woman told her, without waiting for an answer. "'The fever that always kills. Sometimes it kills quickly, but most of the time very slowly, just as it is killing me. You will not feel much pain. You will laugh and sing and dream strange dreams.' those are always the symptoms at first before the fever reaches the last stage you will laugh loud and hilariously like this she threw back her head and then came an outburst of screaming laughter that made helen shudder that's how it sounds at first but later when the fever has burned out your strength and destroyed your reason the laughter will be low and soft and lilting then it sounds like this she gave a series of low tinkling sounds that were like a requiem set to laughter helen shivered just so had virginia darrow gone laughing to her death the coincidence seemed rather weird the stark realism of the imitation gripped her and yet she wondered whether she were dreaming or whether the woman beside her were reveling in the fancies of a maniac the other stiffened suddenly. She seemed to recall something which her encounter with Helen had temporarily blotted from her mind. Placing two fingers across her lips, she cast a swift glance up the stairs. For a brief space she stood tense, listening. "'The woman who watches me went to sleep, and I stole away from her,' she whispered. "'We must try to get out before they begin looking for me.' You must come, too. It won't do for you to remain a moment longer. Shh! Silent as a wraith, she stole down the hall. Helen, scarcely knowing what she was doing, followed dazedly. She did not know what to think, but there was an undertow of vague dread in her jumbled thoughts and emotions. What she had just heard sounded wildly fantastical like the raving of a deranged mind. Yet she had a feeling that something was dreadfully wrong. The strange laughter and the face at the window appeared to give a background of reality to what the woman had said. They seemed to suggest, too, that there was a connecting link between Azure Crest and the tragedy in the Thelma Theater. It was this circumstance, bewildering and almost unbelievable, that clogged the functioning of Helen's mind and rendered her willing to be led along by her guide. The door was unlocked and they passed unhindered into the open. In a dull and indifferent fashion, Helen thought it strange that the woman's loud laughter had not already betrayed them, but then it occurred to her that perhaps such outbursts were common at Azure Crest. After what she had already seen and heard, nothing would have surprised her greatly. She wondered how her companion meant to overcome the obstacles of the locked gate and the high picket fence. Perhaps, in her beclouded state of mind and eagerness to escape, she was not even giving them a thought. Or perhaps... Her guide stopped so abruptly that Helen who had been following close behind, nearly ran into her. Out of the mist and shadows came a low, rumbling growl. A huge black shape bounded toward them. "'The dog!' 
exclaimed the other. I forgot. Oh! The beast, rearing on hind legs, sprang at her throat and felled her. She lay prone on the ground, the dog crouching over her with jaws slavering and forefeet pawing her body. Helen stood motionless in her tracks. The dog's eyes and teeth gleamed menacingly in the moonlight, and she knew that the slightest move would precipitate an attack upon her. Her mind, clearing rapidly under the stress of danger, was seeking a way out of the predicament when hurried footsteps came down the walk. "'Caesar!' called a gruff voice. The dog let go its hold as a man came running toward them. He stopped and gathered the fallen woman in his arms, and Helen recognized the individual who had met her at the gate on her arrival. With scarcely a glance in her direction, he turned and walked toward the house with his burden. Helen, feeling the gleaming eyes of the beast on her face, dared not move. As she stood wondering what to do, a shadow fell across the graveled walk, and a second man came toward her. "'Back to your kennel, Caesar,' he commanded, and the dog obediently slunk away. "'Excellent watchdog, but a bit ferocious when he is kept on half rations. "'Won't you come inside, Miss... er... Uh, Hardwick? "'Hawks told me about you. I am Mr. Slade.' sorry to have kept you waiting his manner and appearance were pleasant enough yet helen felt an impulse to run the things she had seen and heard since coming to azure crest were highly mystifying and they had left a number of questions and suspicions in her mind she glanced quickly toward the picket fence then in the direction whence caesar had disappeared Something told her that a whistle would set the dog snapping and snarling at her heels if she should try to break away. She decided that her hope lay in diplomacy rather than flight. As if he had read her thoughts, Slade touched her arm and escorted her to the house. She sensed that a trying ordeal was ahead of her, and she was already steeling her nerves for it. She had faced danger many times, and her buoyant nature always responded to the demands of a crisis with a quickening of wits and rising courage. "'I trust Miss Neville didn't annoy you,' murmured Slade apologetically as he opened the door and conducted her down the hall. "'A very difficult case of paranoia. She gets quite violent at times, and she is subject to all sorts of hallucinations.' Tonight she broke away from her nurse, and would no doubt have attempted to scale the fence if Caesar hadn't interrupted her. Helen walked beside him in silence. She had already wondered whether Miss Neville could be quite sane. Oddly enough, Slade's words almost convinced her that the woman was of sound mind, though perhaps she was suffering from the effects of illness and shock. Helen had conceived an immediate and instinctive distrust of Slade, despite his smooth-flowing speech and suave manners. He ushered her into the same room she had left so hurriedly upon hearing the laughter, and placed a chair for her. A look at his face in the electric light gave edge to her misgivings, but at first she could not tell what there was about him that repelled her. According to all standards, he should have attracted her and inspired confidence in her. His personality contained that blend of strength and gentleness which she had liked in men ever since her days of inconsequential hero-worship. He had the strong jaw and high forehead that often go with aggressiveness and mental keenness, and he carried his tall figure with the easy grace of a man of the world. His presence would have been quite magnetic if only— But Helen could not finish the thought. There was an unnameable something about him that eluded her mental grasp. "'Quite a sad case, that of Miss Neville,' he continued. She was once a very brilliant woman, but her genius was consumed by its own fire, so to speak. 
I might as well tell you that she is my half-sister. For her own good, and to avoid unpleasant notoriety, I am keeping her here under the care of a physician. Her friends believe that she is traveling abroad, and, so far, I have succeeded in keeping the true state of affairs secret. There is a possibility, though a very remote one, that she will recover. Helen made no comment. Though his eyes were lowered seemingly on the floor, she felt he was watching her and wondering whether she believed him. She thought it strange that he should have taken her into his confidence in regard to manners which one usually does not divulge to strangers. There were a number of questions on the tip of her tongue, but she thought it better to hold them back. "'I suppose,' Slade went on in melancholy tones, "'that she told you the usual story of mistreatment and persecution?' "'She seemed very excited.' Helen weighed her words with care. I don't remember all she told me, but she said something of a fever that was gradually killing her, and she seemed very anxious to get away from this place. Yes, the fever is one of her hallucinations. She imagines that she is suffering from a strange disease. And not only that, but she thinks everybody around her afflicted with the same mysterious malady. The idea is firmly rooted in her mind that the disease has been deliberately communicated to her by enemies. No doubt she told you of a queer kind of laughter that is supposed to be one of the symptoms of the strange ailment. She not only mentioned it, but she gave me a demonstration. It sounded a bit creepy. I can readily believe it. It must have been very unpleasant for you. I take it that she told you the story convincingly enough to make an impression on you, or you would not have started to run away with her. He smiled as he spoke, and all at once Helen saw the reason for her instinctive dislike of him. The smile was of the lips only. There was no responsive gleam in his eyes, and his eyes, she now perceived, were hard and dispassionate as bits of porcelain. She frightened me, and I didn't know what to think, she guardedly admitted. I suppose I followed her on the impulse of the moment. I do most things on impulse, you see. That's the privilege of youth. He laughed, but his eyes were as glossy and expressionless as fish scales, and seemed to veto his vocal merriment. Luckily you wouldn't have got further than the gate, even if Caesar hadn't intervened. It would be very embarrassing if Miss Neville should escape from us some night and expose her condition to the world. There is slight danger of that, though. I have taken all necessary precautions. However, your meeting Miss Neville here and noticing the state she is in makes the situation rather awkward. I should dislike to have the matter get into the newspapers. I have been frank with you, hoping you would see the delicacy of the situation from my point of view. I never gossip about people's misfortunes, declared Helen with emphasis. Thank you. I know I can depend on you, Miss Hardwick. I hope Caesar didn't frighten you. By the way, and suddenly he seemed to remember something, my secretary told me you were inquiring for Mr. Venardi. Helen started slightly. For an hour she had been wondering why she had seen nothing of the gray phantom, and why her request to see him had been met with evasions and cross-questioning. Slade regarded her with polite curiosity. "'I have seen your name in the newspapers, Miss Hardwick.' You wrote the play that Vincent Starr produced at his theater. Only a little while ago I was reading of the peculiar tragedy that interrupted the first performance last night. I wonder whether your visit here has anything to do with that occurrence. It was a strange question, Helen thought. I, I would rather talk over my errand with Mr. Venardi in person, she stammered. She was chilled and confused by his steady gaze. "'Isn't he here?' 
Slade's lips twitched. "'You know, of course, that Mr. Venardi is the genial rascal who used to be known as the Grey Phantom.' "'You needn't answer. I see that you do. It strikes me as rather odd that a young lady of your evident refinement and culture should be associated with a man of that type. Pardon my impertinence. The fact of the matter is that Mr. Venardi is not here. He left Azurecrest some time ago. What? Helen half rose from the chair. With the great exertion of willpower, she steadied herself. Mr. Venardi not here? Then where is he? That I don't know. I purchased Azure Crest from him through a broker. I never had any dealings with the man himself. In fact, at the time I bought the place, I didn't know that it had been occupied by the Gray Phantom. You see, I had been looking for a secluded spot where Miss Neville could live quietly and without fear of unwelcome intrusions. Azure Crest seemed to answer the requirements, and so I bought it. Helen stared at him, unable to disguise her bewilderment. Slade's statement amazed and shocked her. She had not been in correspondence with the Gray Phantom, but at their last meeting he had told her to communicate with him at Azure Crest if she should ever need him. She thought it strange that he had not sent her word of his removal. Slade was sauntering leisurely back and forth across the floor. Now and then, as he looked at her, his eyes gave her a chill. She made a strong effort to gather her thoughts and master her feelings. Something, she did not know just what, told her that the occasion demanded a cool head and steady nerves. A motor horn sounded in the distance. Evidently a car was winding its way up the hill. The thought gave her a vague sense of comfort. She sat up straight. "'I told the man who met me at the gate that I wished to see Mr. Venardi,' she remarked. Later I told Hawks the same thing. Neither one intimated that Mr. Venardi was no longer here. I was asked a lot of useless questions and asked to wait. Then—' "'My dear Miss Hardwick,' smoothly interrupted Slade, "'you must understand that the circumstances under which my half-sister and myself are living here make it necessary for me to be very cautious with regard to visitors. My servants have orders to subject all callers to careful inspection and cross-examination. For instance, how do I know that you are not a newspaper reporter looking for a sensation? Helen smiled. The suggestion seemed so absurd. Once more the blare of a horn sounded in the distance. "'And that reminds me,' Slade went on in slightly altered tones, "'that you have not yet explained your presence here. I asked you a moment ago whether it had anything to do with what happened at the Thelma Theatre.' so you did helen's smile though tantalizing was the kind with which one masks an inner turbulence i am waiting for your answer slade seemed as suave and urbane as before but his eye was a trifle frostier and his tone carried a peremptory note helen glanced at the window a glare like that of a motor-car's headlight was approaching the house. "'Your question is very peculiar,' she replied with a haughtiness which she did not quite feel. "'And I see no reason why I should answer it.' "'No?' Slade had ceased his pacing of the floor, and Helen wondered whether it was by design or accident that he had stopped with his back to the door. Perhaps the question will seem less peculiar if I word it differently. What did you mean when you told Hawks that the business you wished to discuss with Venardi had to do with Mr. Shea? Helen felt a tingle of suspense. There was a sneer on Slade's lips, and his frigid eyes filled her with a vague dread. She tried to parry the question with banter, but the words would not come. She twisted in her chair 
and suddenly, as the door behind Slade's back came open, her gaze grew rigid and a look of consternation filled her eyes. She gripped the arms of her chair and very slowly raised herself to her feet, all the while staring intently at the figure whose arrival had been heralded a few minutes ago by the headlight's glare. The newcomer seemed startled at first, then he smiled. Slade stepped aside and bowed deferentially to the man in the doorway. Then he noticed Helen's transfigured face. "'You two seem to have met before,' he remarked. Helen advanced a step. She drew a long, trembling breath. A staggering realization flashed through her mind as she gazed rigidly into the newcomer's smiling face. It was the same realization that had come to her with such unnerving force in the Thelma Theater. It had grown hazy and vague during the intervening hours, and the quick succession of events had left her wondering. Now she knew that her first intuitive suspicion had been correct. Her mind seemed to reel and spin. She hardly knew that her lips were moving, but her voice, hoarse and scarcely audible, was uttering a name, Mr. Shea. Chapter Six, The Phantom Orchid. Cuthbert Venardi sat in his library at Sea Glimpse and tried hard to fix his mind on Paxton's botanical dictionary. Despite his best efforts, it was a hopeless task. His thoughts would go gypsying and every now and then the print would blur and fade or dissolve into fanciful images that had nothing to do with hybridization and cross-pollination of orchids. A problem had been teasing Venardi's imagination for months. He had struggled with it in idle moments while resting from more ambitious experiments. Specimens from his gardens were shown each year at the horticultural expositions in New York and Boston, where they created much favorable comment among experts and caused endless speculation concerning the identity of the anonymous exhibitor who had private and excellent reasons for remaining unknown. The problem he was now working on, however, was merely a diversion from his more serious work. He wanted to create a gray orchid. It was to be a particular shade of gray, a dim, mystic gray, like the color of the sky just before dawn, or the hue of the sea in a light fog. The novelty of the idea appealed to him, and the task was proving difficult enough to give him gentle stimulation. Furthermore, gray always had been his favorite color, and he had almost decided that the hybrid, when once evolved, should be known as the phantom orchid. It was merely a whim, of course, the vagary of a mind so active that it must be working even at play. For the matter of that, he often told himself that of late years his life had been little else than a succession of fancies and dim shades of reality. The gardens he had planted and the products that gained such flattering comment in the horticultural journals had been nothing but a tangible expression of a passionate desire to blot out the past and efface that other self whom the outside world called the gray phantom. In those other days he had gone, like a rollicking Robin Hood, from one stupendous adventure to another. Without thought of sordid gain, but merely to assuage an inborn craving for excitement, he had dipped into a whirl of exploits that caused the public to gasp and hold its breath. The police, bedeviled and outwitted at every turn, had gritted their teeth and muttered anathemas even while admitting that the gray phantom always played the game fairly and that his victims, more often than not, were villains of a far blacker dye than he. It had been a mad carousel and for a time it had given the phantom all the thrills his nature craved. Nearly always his left hand had tossed away what his right had plucked. Mysterious and untraceable contributions had poured in upon hospitals, orphan asylums, 
societies for the protection of animals, and other philanthropic organizations. Widows, invalids, and paupers were befriended in a way that caused them to believe in a return of the day of miracles. Dreamers starving in garrets and inventors struggling to keep body and soul together were tided over many a trying crisis. Through it all, the gray phantom had maintained an elusiveness that confounded the keenest man-hunters among the police and wrapped his identity in a mysterious glamour. Simple-minded people wondered whether he were being of flesh and blood or a shade on earthly rampage. His one arrest, back in the early stages of his career, had settled their doubts once for all, but an astonishing escape a few days later caused them to wag their heads and speak in hushed tones of a rogue whose feats and juggleries bewildered them. The phantom laughed quietly at their perplexity. The performances that awed and puzzled them seemed simple enough to him. He was merely unleashing his imagination and giving free sway to his boundless energies of body and mind. In another stage he might have been a sea-roving Viking or a builder of ancient empires. At times, when one of his softer moods was upon him, he wondered why his restless spirit and the fires within him could not have found a different and more soul-satisfying outlet. Then his thoughts would go back to dimly remembered days, with their shadowy recollections of early orphanage, and the picadillos of street urchins, and somehow he thought he understood. But as time passed, his restless moods came back with increasing frequency, and little by little he lost taste for the life he was leading and the adventures that had made his sobriquet known from coast to coast. Then there came lapses between the gray phantom's exploits, and finally they ceased altogether. The world, not knowing with what lavish hand he had flung away his spoils, supposed he had collected his treasures and gone into hiding, and the police grimly predicted that he would reappear as soon as he had squandered his ill-gotten gains. No one guessed that the phantom had built a hermitage on his desolate hilltop, where, surrounded by a few of his art treasures and a small group of faithful followers, he was trying to reconstruct his life in peace. Azure Crest was the name he had given his secluded retreat, and there he had tried to destroy the links that still chained him to the past and to blot out the tantalizing visions of other days. For a time he had almost succeeded. Then a restlessness had come upon him, for which the desolate hilltop afforded no relief, and he felt that his mountain retreat, with its collection of relics and reminders of bygone times, was too closely associated with the things he wanted to forget. Finally he had disposed of the place through a broker and purchased a narrow strip of land by the sea. He could not analyze the obscure motives and hidden impulse that had impelled him to seek seclusion at Sea Glimpse, a slender tongue of wooded land surrounded on three sides by jagged coastline and in the rear by forest and farmland. But while at work clearing the ground for his garden, he had felt a grateful remoteness from things he wished to forget, and a measure of peace and satisfaction had come to him while he put his unpractised hands to strange tasks, or wandered among the trees and listened to the murmurs of the sea. He often wondered whether he would be content to spend his life in this secluded nook of the world where, safely hidden and secure from intrusion, he could devote himself to his hobby and his books. The question came back to him again as he closed his paxton and got up to light the reading lamp. For months he had felt that the links connecting him with the past were snapping. The gray phantom had emerged from retirement only once, and then he had ventured forth in a good cause. In a little while, perhaps, he would be dead and almost forgotten. The gray orchid, if Varnity should ever succeed in bringing it out, 
would be the living symbol of whatever had been good in his other self. The thought more than once had appealed to his imagination and the whimsical strain in his nature. He turned toward the window, but he had taken only a few steps when he stopped and looked dreamily into space. Memories thronged his mind, and a face appeared out of nowhere, a woman's face. For months it had haunted him in his idle moments, inspiring him with vague and exhilarant emotions. He saw it now, softly radiant among the shadows, an enchanting embodiment of the bloom and freshness of youth that pursued him with the persistence of a delicate scent or the strain of an all but forgotten song. Helen, he murmured. The vision grew a little clearer. Now he could almost see her figure, slim and straight, and moving with the easy swing and grace of a young antelope. Echoes of her voice came to him, clear and unaffected and vibrant with joyous vivacity, each melodious note touching an harmonious chord within him. He remembered that her face had given him a curious impression of youthful buoyancy, mingling with the soberness of maturity. Her quick intuition, coupled with a strain of subtlety in her nature and a trace of precocious sophistication that was both puzzling and enchanting, had seemed to bridge the years that lay between them. The vitalic sheen and the subtle aroma of her hair had given him a foolish desire to see what the sun and wind would do to it if she were to loosen it and romp in his garden. He sighed musingly. Months had passed since he had last seen her. For a brief, unforgettable moment he had held her hand, and the contact had given him a gentle, all-pervading thrill and filled him with the strange, tender emotions. Her eyes, warm and frank, but with a touch of shyness lurking in their depths, as if she were still a little afraid of him, had inspired him with a tingling ecstasy such as the gray phantom in his wildest triumphs had never experienced. Twice he had written her since then, once to apprise her of his removal from Azure Crest, and once to inquire concerning her well-being, but he had neither expected nor received an answer. He had not forgotten that in the eyes of the world he was still an outlaw, a hunted thing. Again he sighed. The vision was fading, and little of it remained with him save a misty picture of loveliness. The moon was rising over the treetops, throwing a white sheen over the landscape and the narrow wedge of water visible between the birches and hemlocks. The old house, purchased by Venardi in a dilapidated condition, and with difficulty rendered habitable, was silent but for the creeping whispers of the wind. For a time the solitary figure at the window stood lost in thoughts. His deep gray eyes, rather too narrow for perfect symmetry, which had been known to stab and sting like rapiers, were not soft and luminous. Small wrinkles radiated from the outer corners, but the eyes themselves were animated by the slow twinkling gleam that characterizes the individual who sifts all the up and downs of life through a sieve of whimsical imagination. The sensitive nostrils and the full arch of the lips denoted a penchant for distilling the maximum of thrills and emotions from the magic of existence. Here and there his face was lined and scarred, and even in repose there was a tension about the lean, tall figure that made one think of a cocked trigger. A knock sounded, and he turned quickly. Through the door waddled a fat man with a woebegone expression and a multiple chin. He groaned and puffed as if the task of carrying his elephantine body through life was not a light burden. The newcomer was Clifford Wade, once the gray phantom's chief lieutenant, and now the major-domo of his little household. "'Wade,' observed the phantom, eyeing the fat man with disapproval, "'you are getting soft. 
this easy and carefree existence is demoralizing you completely the other placed a stack of newspapers and a few letters on the table then slumped into a chair and gazed ruefully down at the protruding curvature of his stomach i know boss i piled on two more pounds last week pretty soon i won't be able to go for the mail any more if you'd only say the word i'd round up the old gang and we'd turn a few more tricks like the ones we used to pull in the good old days i'd work off this fat in no time the phantom shook his head no wade you will have to try some other form of fat reducer i am through with the old life for good it was exciting while it lasted but the novelty has worn off it was only a sort of emotional eruption anyhow wade scowled then delivered himself of a startling exclamation hang the women the phantom raised his brow in surprise what's your grievance against the fair sex wade hanging is pretty serious business you know what atrocious crime have the women perpetrated against you to deserve such cruel punishment you don't look like a man suffering the pangs of unrequited love your heart is intact i hope oh my heart's all right wade complained it's yours that i'm worrying about lately i haven't been able to dope you out at all boss if i didn't know you as well as i do i'd say you've gone plumb dippy there was a time not so long ago when you went in for big game real he-man stuff there were a lot of men on the police force who used to have a funny feeling around the solar plexus whenever the gray phantom's name was spoken you cut some fancy dedos in those days boss now now you're poking seeds into the ground and talking of reforming wade made a gesture of great disgust granted said the phantom smiling but is that any reason for exterminating the feminine sex you bet it is the trouble with you is that you've got too much girl on the brain boss you were all right until that pretty little skirt with the big baby eyes happened along oh you mean miss hardwick there was an odd tension in the phantom's tones that's who i mean she's easy on the eyes and all that but she sure raised the devil with you the old kind of life was good enough for you till she bobbed up it was then that you started all this mushy talk about going straight and changing your ways i know because i've been watching you the phantom was strangely silent twice he crossed the floor then paused before the window and looked out into the shadowy landscape there was a pensive gleam in his eyes as if wade's speech had turned his thoughts into new channels suddenly he laughed and the new expression that came into his face suggested that he had been an all-revealing flash i am much obliged to you for that bit of psychoanalysis he told the fat man you're right wade absolutely right i was a fool not to see it before not to see what a faint smile flickered across the phantom's face that miss hardwick has had a great deal to do with my determination to change my ways i hadn't realized it until you spoke just now i had been inclined to give myself all the credit thanks to your somewhat crude but accurate statement of the case i can see now that all of it belongs to her wade's round little eyes embedded in layers of flesh stared uncomprehendingly at the phantom i don't get you at all boss then don't try your heart is in the right place wade but you lack imagination and there are some things that you and i can't view from the same angle miss hardwick's influence in my life is one of them sorry to disappoint an old pal but my determination to stay on the straight and narrow path 
is stronger than ever. Wade made a wry face. You'll suit yourself, of course, but it might interest you to know that another man is stealing your thunder while you're dancing to the piping of a skirt. He opened one of the newspapers he had placed on the table and pointed to a black face caption. The phantom, looking over his massive shoulder, read, Mr. Shea's name on dying lips. His eyes narrowed gradually as he read the highly colored account of the tragedy in the Thelma Theater. There was a pucker of perplexity on his forehead when he finished. "'Wonder what Mr. Shea is up to this time,' he mumbled, gazing thoughtfully at the floor. "'I've been following the fellow's exploits for some time. "'This is a bit out of the ordinary, eh, Wade?' "'You said it, boss. "'And you can bet your sweet life he's getting ready for something big this time. "'Unless I'm a poor guesser, the affair at the Thelma last night was only the beginning.' Mr. Shea's schemes run deep, and he never strikes a blow unless he's got an object in view. There's something queer about the murder of that woman, boss. The phantom nodded. Looks as though you were right, Wade. Mr. Shea is out after big game this time, and in all likelihood the Thelma affair is only the prelude. But I don't see how— "'There's another queer thing about this, Mr. Shea,' interrupted the fat man. "'Maybe you've noticed it. I don't know how many jobs he's pulled off, but every one of them has shown the slickest kind of workmanship. What's more,' and Wade's eyes peered cunningly into the other's face, "'most of them look as though you'd had a hand in them yourself. That's what I meant when I said another man is stealing your thunder.' The phantom started. Then a thin smile parted his lips. "'Yes, I have noticed it, Wade. I have studied Mr. Shea's methods as carefully as has been possible, from the superficial and distorted newspaper accounts, and I have observed that he has done me the questionable honor of adopting some of the methods and stratagems I used to practice in the past. In a number of instances, he has copied my technique so closely that I've often wondered whether I've been walking in my sleep or whether my old self has come back in a new form. It's been almost uncanny. He laughed musingly. What do you make of it, Wade? I think you'd better take another fling at the old game before this Mr. Shea gets a monopoly on it. I didn't mean that. How do you account for the similarity of methods? The fat man pondered. Somebody has studied your tricks and put them into practice. Somebody that's been close enough to you to watch you in action. Maybe, and the glow of a sudden idea lighted up his face, a member of our old crowd. Say, boss, wouldn't it be a joke on you if Mr. Shea should turn out to be a graduate of your own gang? Worse than a joke, said the phantom grimly. He paced the floor with quick, short steps, his hands clenched at his back. I have given the mysterious Mr. Shea a great deal of thought in the past few months, and I fear you are right. His tactics so closely resemble mine that I suspect he learned them from me at first hand. In the old days, I often took a sort of foolish pride in teaching my methods to the more adaptable ones among the members of my organization. It pleased me to watch their development under my training. I didn't realize then what I was doing. Now, he shrugged as if to dismiss a futile regret. Yes, it's quite likely that Mr. Shea is a former pupil of mine. Well, what are you going to do about it? The phantom stopped abruptly, gazing at the fat man with a faraway gleam in his eye, as if they were miles apart. I thought the gray phantom was dead, he murmured. 
it appears i have been mistaken if mr shea is a product of the gray phantom's brain then my old self is still active for every crime committed by mr shea the gray phantom bears responsibility he gave a dismal laugh and i thought i had destroyed most of the links connecting me with the old times well said wade again this time a little testily just what are you going to do about it the phantom did not answer immediately he was staring absent-mindedly into space presently he looked at his watch then he nodded thoughtfully wish you would pack my grip wade the fat man started from the chair not going away yes there's a train for new york a few minutes past midnight in the morning bright and early i shall start a little campaign campaign wade's eyes bulged what kind of campaign the biggest one of my life i think i am going out to lay the gray phantom's ghost in plain words i propose to go to the warpath against the mysterious mr shea i fancy it will be quite an exciting little tussle wade chapter seven mr shea shows his hand in the dusk of the following morning a tall gray-clad figure alighted from a train in the grand central terminal glanced cautiously to right and left among the thin scattering of passengers and with a furtive air traversed the vast concourse and gained the street by one of the side exits with the habitual vigilance of a hunted man he paused for a few moments under the canopy and scanned the face of each loiterer and passer-by a dull discordant din testified that the city was awakening and a pale shimmer of dawn was shattering the mists hanging like a gauzy veil over manhattan finally the gray-clad figure moved on walked a block and a half to the west and selecting an unpretentious restaurant stepped in and ordered breakfast the gray phantom's campaign was on perils lurked everywhere though he had changed his ways he had not yet paid off his old scores he still had the law to reckon with for the outstanding charges against him were grave and numerous enough to send him to prison for the rest of his life the capture of the gray phantom once one of the most celebrated of rogues would create a profound sensation and confer great fame on the captor once it became known that he had emerged from his hiding place the entire city would be converted into a huge man-trap with claws set to catch the celebrated outlaw that was not all the newspaper accounts of the police inquiry into the thelma tragedy which the phantom had carefully perused on the train had hinted rather broadly that mr shea and the gray phantom were identical it was pointed out that mr shea's exploits were the only ones in recent years that had equaled the phantoms as to magnitude and daring and that there were many points of similarity in the methods of the two rogues to be sure the phantom had never been known to stoop to murder but this did not necessarily eliminate him as an object of suspicion and it was significant that the commission of the crime had been hedged in with all the subtlety and mysteriousness that characterized the gray phantom's tactics it was predicted that if the gray phantom were apprehended the mystery surrounding the identity and the movements of mr shea would be cleared up automatically the phantom smiled faintly as he finished his breakfast and walked out his step was elastic and his eye held the steely gleam which his former associates had learned to interpret as a sign that their leader was bent on some stupendous adventure it was still early and there was only a thin sprinkling of traffic in the streets and the chances of his being recognized were correspondingly slight as yet he had no definite plan in mind 
his decision to make war on mr shea had been made suddenly and largely on the impulse of the moment it was in keeping with his determination to blot out that part of himself which the world knew as the gray phantom the realization had come to him in a flash that the work of his other self was being carried on vicariously by the person known as mr shea if his suspicions were correct and if the latter was indeed a disciple of his then mr shea was a part of the past he had vowed to uproot and destroy his regeneration would not be complete until this object had been accomplished he chuckled a little as he walked along it was odd he thought that wade should have guessed the motive for his determination to tear his past to shreds throughout his striving and reaching for something higher and better the phantom had vaguely and instinctively felt that the bright brown eyes of helen hardwick were his lodestars but wade's crudely phrased remark had been needed to make the impression clear he knew it was largely because of helen's faith in him that he was now attacking the hardest and most perilous task of his career vaguely he wondered what she would think when she heard of his latest adventure and he felt a fleeting temptation to tell her of his decision he rejected it however resolving it would be time enough to make his plans known to her when they were in a more mature shape the sight of a knot of curious idlers outside a drug store in times square caused him to quicken his steps he knew the psychology of city crowds and that the merest trifle is sufficient to attract a throng but this gathering seemed to have been drawn together by something out of the ordinary as unobtrusively as he could he wedged his way through the little crowd consisting mostly of homeward bound night workers and belated pleasure seekers and now he saw the object of their interest was a small square of paper pasted to the pane of the show window a flicker of surprise crossed the phantom's face as he read the typewritten inscription for the diversion of the public and the edification of the police i beg to announce that my next and so far greatest coup will be directed against the seven wealthiest men in new york city whose names i shall take a pleasure in announcing in a day or two by a unique and sensational method of persuasion these gentlemen will be induced to transfer half of their respective fortunes to me mr shea a grin tugged at the phantom's lips as he read the announcement a second time mr shea in flaunting his intentions before the eyes of the public and the police was living up to the time-honored traditions of melodrama it was of a piece with the rascal's erratic and extravagant nature and the boastful phrasing of the announcement as well as the incidental taunt flung at the police was quite characteristic of him yet despite the pompous claptrap with which mr shea was adorning his project the magnitude of it appealed to the phantom's imagination it was fully as great and daring an enterprise as the phantom himself had ever attempted if the scheme succeeded and mr shea's undertakings invariably did the loot would run well into ten figures from remarks dropped by the bystanders he gathered that stickers bearing the same boastful announcements had been distributed during the early morning hours at various points throughout the city mr shea seemed to have spared no pains in his effort to startle the metropolis the phantom was edging away from the throng when a few words spoken in low and drawling tones caused him to look quickly aside pardon but haven't we met before the phantom felt a faint thrill of apprehension recognition at this point might prove disastrous to his plans beside him with tired and red-lidded eyes peering into his face stood a tall gaunt man whose somewhat ludicrous appearance was accentuated by full evening dress 
"'I think not,' he said hastily, and started to walk away. The other, refusing to be squelched, fell into step beside him. "'Now, isn't that queer?' he remarked with a wheezy chuckle. "'The moment I saw you it occurred to me that your face seemed familiar. By the way, what do you think of Mr. Shea's latest?' "'Quite ambitious.' The phantom gave his uninvited companion a keen glance, and the covert scrutiny stirred several shadowy recollections in his mind. The curious individual seemed well past middle age, and his sallow complexion and furrowed face indicated decrepit health. He walked with a shuffling gait and a catarrhal affection of the nose necessitated frequent use of his handkerchief. The phantom was trying to recall when and under what circumstances they had met before, but his face indicated nothing but annoyance at an unwelcome intrusion. "'Ambitious is the word,' assented the man in evening dress. "'Do you know, my dear sir, that if Mr. Shea carries out his threat and annexes fifty per cent of the seven biggest fortunes in town, his net gain will run into the billions?' I can only hope that I am not one of the seven selected for shearing. The phantom gave him another quick glance. A gleam of humor relieved the war-begone expression of the man's face. Again the phantom searched his memory. The last remark had carried a strong hint to the effect that his companion was a man of great wealth. My name, as you probably know, although you pretend to have forgotten it, is W. Rufus Fairspeckle, continued the other, taking the phantom's arm and turning into a side street. I don't know how many millions I have, but I have enough to make me a shining mark for Mr. Shea's latest offensive. Ah, I see you remember me now. The phantom's involuntary start had betrayed him. The mere mention of Mr. Fairspeckle's name had instantly clarified his hazy recollections. He recalled now that some five or six years ago he had had a brief and casual encounter with the man. It had occurred in the course of one of the phantom's spectacular adventures, and he had almost forgotten the incident that brought them together. Now, as the memory of it flashed back into his mind, he gazed more intently at his companion. As the man himself had intimated, W. Rufus Fairspeckle was one of the wealthiest men in New York City. Mostly through luck and partly through an inborn genius for speculation, he had amassed a huge fortune. At fifty he had retired from business declaring that he had worked hard all his life and was entitled to a rest and a little diversion. Then he had promptly proceeded to the enjoyment of the pleasures that had been denied him in his youth, and he had gone about it with an avidity that created a great deal of jocular comment and made him known as a very eccentric individual. "'You have a long memory,' observed the phantom, glancing uneasily at Mr. Fairspeckle's formal attire. It drew many amused glances from pedestrians, and the phantom did not care to attract unnecessary attention. "'Now, if you will excuse me, I think I will wish you good morning. I have a busy day ahead of me.' "'Not so fast,' protested Mr. Fairspeckle, clutching the phantom's sleeve with his long, bony fingers. You are coming with me. The words had a peremptory sound. The phantom knitted his brows. Why, if I may ask? See that cop? Mr. Fairspeckle pointed to a blue-coated figure half a block ahead. He's a hard-working soul, and presumably he is ambitious to obtain promotion. The capture of the gray phantom would be quite an event in his humdrum life. The phantom sensed a threat. He glanced about him quickly. The streets were rapidly filling with traffic, and to break away might not prove easy. Besides, 
he was curious to know the reason for mr fairspeckle's evident determination to detain him deciding to adopt the safer course he simulated an affable smile suppose we let the hard-working cop earn his promotion some other way he suggested where to mr fairspeckle my apartment at the whipple hotel we're almost there glad you are going to be reasonable mr venardi i need someone to talk to ever suffer from insomnia never lucky dog insomnia is the bane of my existence at times when i can't sleep i sit at the club and bore my friends to death when i have no friends to talk to i walk last night i walked from one end of manhattan island to the other and halfway back again oh yes i'm more chipper than what you would think from looking at me well my rambles last night explain why you see me in these togs i was just about tired enough to fall asleep standing on my feet when i saw mr shay's notice in an instant i was wide awake again confound the fellow's impudence here we are the phantom was conducted through the chastely carved portals of one of the quieter hotels in the upper forties and a few moments later they were facing each other across the redwood table in mr fairspeckle's library the apartment though luxuriously appointed was a faithful reflection of the eccentric nature of its occupant you are careless mr venardi said mr fairspeckle musingly the partly drawn shades admitted only a vague half dawn into the room and the shadows lent an air of mysteriousness to his appearance it isn't safe for a man in your position to walk about without disguise disguises are treacherous things i have used them now and then but ordinarily i feel safer without them anyhow no one but you is aware of my presence in new york mr fairspeckle drew a palm across his chin his red-lidded eyes regarded the phantom shrewdly i wonder what brings you to new york at this particular time at the very time when mr shea is launching his most ambitious scheme you will admit the coincidence is rather striking some people might deduce from it that i am mr shea suggested the phantom smiling they would be wrong there was a quiver at the corners of mr fairspeckle's thin lips his eyes held a suspicious twinkle perhaps he commented dryly then he fell to drumming the table with his fingertips what i would like to know for certain is whether i am one of the seven you see i wouldn't object to being murdered by this mr shea most people think i'm leading a useless life and ought to be dead anyhow it won't be long until an undertaker pumps my carcass full of formaldehyde what i object to is the idea of being swindled out of my money no man ever got the best of me yet and i don't intend that mr shea shall make a fool of me he can kill me but i won't hand him a cent i'll be hanged if i will he thumped the table with his fist there was something so ludicrous about his grim earnestness that the phantom could scarcely repress a smile at the same time he was conscious of a suspicion for which he could not quite account mr fairspeckle's indignation seemed not quite natural even the vehement thump of his fist against the table had an artificial sound an intuition flashing into his mind out of nowhere held the phantom spellbound for a moment in the next instant he laughed inwardly at the absurdity of it telling himself that he must hold his imagination in leash it will be interesting to see how mr shea intends to proceed he casually remarked it will spluttered mr fairspeckle you can trust him to work some devilishly clever scheme he always does do you suppose 
and he bent his bony frame over the table and gazed searchingly at the phantom that the murder at the thelma theater night before last was the first episode in his latest enterprise of mr shays you mean the murder of miss darrow there seems to be no doubt but that mr shay had a hand in it everything points to he paused of a sudden all at once it occurred to him that there was something odd about mr fairspeckle's question immediately upon reading of the thelma murder the phantom had suspected that it was the prelude to another of mr shay's spectacular adventures but the suspicion had been wholly intuitive as far as outward appearances went there was nothing in the murder of virginia darrow to suggest that it was anything more than an isolated incident it was curious therefore that mr fairspeckle should look for a connecting link between the crime at the thelma and mr shay's threat everything points to mr shay as the perpetrator of the murder he guardedly went on but whether the crime has any bearing on mr shay's new venture is hard to tell it doesn't seem likely how could he possibly further his scheme by an act of that kind his plan is to separate seven of new york's richest men from half of their wealth how is the death of miss darrow going to help him in an undertaking of that kind a sly smile twitched the corners of mr fairspeckle's lips nevertheless he observed i think that you and i agree i am a pretty good judge of faces and your expression a moment ago betrayed you mr venardi my question seemed innocent enough at first but on second thought it startled you suppose we be frank both of us believe that the thelma affair was the beginning of mr shay's latest move we can't see how or why just now, but we know that his schemes run deep. Isn't it so? The phantom, momentarily baffled by the older man's shrewd deductions, gazed pensively at the ceiling. A jumble of thoughts and questions shot back and forth through his mind. Did Mr. Fairspeckle suspect that Mr. Shea and the gray phantom were identical? or was it possible that he did not finish the thought the suspicion that had come to him several times during the interview seemed just as unreasonable as it was startling and it had no firmer foundation than two or three puzzling circumstances and a tantalizing touch of mysteriousness in mr fairspeckle's attitude it's an interesting theory and i've given quite a little thought to it he finally admitted strange that the same idea should have come to both of us isn't it especially since there seems to be neither reason nor logic behind it how did you happen to think of it mr fairspeckle the other man stroked his lean chin with a self-satisfying air what's that old saw about great minds traveling in the same channel I don't know just how the idea came to me, but I'm glad we understand each other. Now we can talk without quibbling. But first, I want a cup of coffee. Hope you will join me. Hayudo! He fairly shouted the last word, but the phantom doubted whether his thin and rasping voice went farther than the walls. Hayudo! Again, Mr. Fairspeckle's voice rose to a shrill but inadequate crescendo. That confounded Jap's pretending he is deaf again. Excuse me, will you? He strode irately from the room and slammed the door. A wrinkle of deep perplexity appeared on the phantom's brow. Mr. Fairspeckle puzzled and intrigued him. Either he was a very slippery individual, or else ingenuousness itself. When he returned and announced that Hayuto would serve their coffee in a few minutes, the phantom searched his face in vain for a sign of guile. If anything, he was a little more affable than on leaving the room. "'That fool doctor of mine tells me I mustn't drink coffee,' he confided. 
tells me it's bad for my nerves and keeps me awake. But my nerves are worn to a frazzle anyhow, and I never can sleep except when I want to stay awake. What were we talking about? Oh, yes, Mr. Shea. He clasped his hands across his diaphragm. A queer smile, at once beatific and diabolical, came over his face. Do you know, he went on in confidential tones, that I don't care a rap if Mr. Shea carries out his scheme as far as the other six are concerned? Of course, I don't know for certain who they are, but it's a safe bet that they are no friends of mine. I have a hunch that every one of them belongs to the old ring that fought me tooth and nail while I was climbing up in the world. It's a long story, and I'm not going to bore you with it, but you can see why I have no love for them. I could die happy tomorrow if I could see them lick the dust today. I feel different toward you, Venardi. We had a tilt once, but you fought fairly. The others tried to knife me in the back. They can go to blazes for all I care. Then you and Mr. Shea seem to have at least one aim in common, the phantom pointed out. He smiled genially, but his eyes were studying every shifting expression in Mr. Fairspeckle's face. For once he felt certain that the older man was not dissembling. The glint of wrath lurking in the depths of his weak eyes and the vindictive sneer about his lips told that he had spoken in all sincerity. "'We have,' he declared grimly. "'I hope he sends the other six to the poorhouse. But I have no intention of letting him pluck me, you understand. That's where our aims clash. He can go as far as he likes with the others, but I'll fight him like a drunken Indian before I give him a red cent. I'll see myself in Hades before I—' A knock and the opening of the door interrupted him. A Japanese with a face as expressionless as mahogany entered with a tray and served them coffee. "'Queer character, Hayuto, observed Mr. Fairspeckle when the servant, silent as a wraith, had retired. I think he would cheerfully commit harakiri if I asked him to do such a senseless thing. He sipped his coffee with an air of keen enjoyment. Great bracer for fagged nerves, eh? Would you believe that for days at a time I live on nothing but coffee? But let's get back to the subject. What shall we do with this pestiferous Mr. Shea? What would you suggest? cautiously inquired the phantom, lifting the cup to his lips. A beam insinuated itself in the creases of Mr. Fairspeckle's face. Now we're getting down to essentials. As I said, Mr. Shea can fleece the other six to his heart's content, but he's got to keep his hands off me. When I saw you standing in front of the drug store reading Mr. Shea's announcement, I was turning a little plan over in my mind. Then I didn't quite see how to work it, but I do now. Again the phantom brought the cup to his lips. He regarded his companion inquiringly. You and I are going to handle Mr. Shea together, declared Mr. Fairspeckle. His face glowed as if a pleasing prospect were warming his soul. We will put a crimp in his scheme and show him— Why, what's the matter, Venardi? The phantom had slouched down in his chair, and now his head began to wag from side to side. Nothing, he murmured dazedly. I just feel a bit drowsy. Would you mind opening the window? The—the the coffee— His eyes rolled— then the lids fluttered and closed, and he sagged limply in the chair. With a gratified chuckle, Mr. Fairspeckle stepped to the other side of the table and regarded him gloatingly. "'The gray phantom isn't half so clever as he's supposed to be,' he mumbled. Then his hand went out and touched a button. 
A moment later, Hayudo stood at attention in the doorway. Hayudo inquired Mr. Fairspeckle, how much chloral did you mix in Mr. Bernardi's cup of coffee? Plenty, said the servant, and this time the ghost of a grin flickered across his face. He sleep long time. Mr. Fairspeckle nodded elatedly. Take him to my bedroom, he instructed, and make him comfortable. With an ease which showed that he possessed all the agile strength of his race, Hayudo carried the phantom into one of the adjoining rooms in the suite, placed him on the bed, and adjusted a pillow under his head. For a few moments he stood peering down into the motionless man's face, then he silently left the room and closed the door behind him. A minute later the phantom raised himself to a sitting posture and blinked his eyes at the sunlight streaming in beneath the drawn window shades. "'You are fairly clever, Mr. Fairspeckle,' he said half aloud. "'But you ought to modernize your methods. Drugged coffee has gone out of fashion. Hope I didn't kill the potted fern at the window behind my chair.' Chapter Eight, The Voice on the Wire the gray phantom lay on his back in w rufus fairspeckle's ample bed and tried to grasp the meaning of what had happened his host's attempt to drug him savored strongly of melodrama and it seemed somewhat grotesque in view of the fact that it had occurred in an up-to-date and centrally located hotel what puzzled him most was the motive behind the attempt if Mr. Fairspeckle suspected that he was Mr. Shea, why had he not handed his guest over to the police? On the other hand, but his conjectures in that direction brought the phantom face to face with a theory that made his thoughts whirl. His eyes flitted over the room. The color combination was restful, but the decorations, and especially the pictures, bespoke rather extreme tastes. He had gathered, from what little he had seen of the surroundings, that Mr. Fairspeckle was occupying a luxurious apartment, consisting of several rooms, and that it had been fitted up to suit his individual requirements. Hayuto, the rat-footed Japanese servant, seemed to be his only companion. An hour passed, and the phantom's cogitations brought him back to the starting point. Nothing seemed certain beyond the indubitable fact that Mr. Fairspeckle was a highly mysterious individual. The rest was full of vague and hazy surmises. The phantom waited patiently, wondering what his host's next move would be, for he had decided to play a passive role for the present. He explored his pockets, and was thankful that his automatic had not been taken from him. Evidently his jailer was depending on the drug to keep him in a harmless condition. His keen ears detected footsteps approaching the door, and in a twinkling he was lying prone on the bed, simulating the complete insensibility that comes with drug-induced sleep. The door came open, then furtive steps crossed the floor, and the phantom felt a pair of sharp eyes on his face. His regular breathing seemed to satisfy the silent watcher, for after a little he turned away. As he reached the door, the phantom flicked open an eyelid and saw Hayuto. Evidently the servant had entered the room to make sure that the effects of the drug were not wearing off. The door closed almost noiselessly. Again the phantom sat up. A glance at his watch told him it was a few minutes after two. He slid his feet from the bed and tiptoed cautiously to a window and raised the shade. As he looked out, an undersized figure on the opposite sidewalk instantly caught his eye. As far as appearances went, the man might have been only an idler engaged in the pastime of ogling the feminine passers-by, 
but the phantom's practiced eyes saw at once that he was there for a purpose the stealthy glances which he occasionally leveled at the windows of mr fairspuckle's apartment gave an unmistakable clue to his mission the phantom's brows contracted as he quickly lowered the shade was it possible someone had seen and recognized him on his way from the station and later trailed him to mr fairspuckle's apartment the thought was annoying for he disliked having his movements hampered by spies then as he turned away from the window another possibility suggested itself perhaps mr fairspeckle and not himself was being kept under surveillance of the fellow on the sidewalk the theory was startling and rather improbable yet it coincided with the suspicion that had kept flashing in and out of the phantom's mind he examined the mechanism of his automatic and made sure the cartridge chamber was loaded he sensed a hint in the air that before long he might have occasion to use the weapon. He was in the act of returning it to his hip pocket when, of a sudden, he pricked up his ears. From somewhere in the apartment came a series of faint clicking sounds. At first he tried in vain to identify them, but finally it came to him that someone was using a typewriter. Typewriter? he mumbled the words seemed to hold a hidden significance but for a while his mind was unable to grasp it he did not believe that either mr fairspeckle or hayuto had occasion to use such an instrument yet he was almost certain that the sounds were coming from one of the adjoining rooms the clicks were slow and irregular he observed indicating that the writer was unfamiliar with the machine and was having some difficulty picking out the characters on the keyboard. He stole to the door and opened it a crack. The sounds became louder, and the writer's awkward groping for the keys was more noticeable now. For a moment the phantom stood listening, then his figure grew suddenly tense. A thin smile hovered over his lips, as he recalled that the announcements which Mr. Shea had distributed throughout the city had been written on a typewriter. It might mean little or nothing, but there was a keen glitter in the phantom's eyes. In itself the clicking of the machine signified scarcely anything, but in conjunction with other circumstances it was fairly suggestive. With noiseless tread, the phantom tiptoed in the direction whence the sounds were coming. Now and then he darted a quick glance about him, as if expecting a rear attack from the Japanese servant. But Hayuto was nowhere in sight. He traversed several rooms before he came to a dead stop in a doorway. At a table near the window, with his back to the phantom, sat Mr. Fairspeckle. He was hunched over a typewriter, laboriously poking at the keys with the index finger of each hand. Silently the phantom approached until he stood directly at the older man's back. Mr. Fairspeckle, all his energy centered on his difficult task, noticed nothing. Leaning slightly forward, the phantom cast a swift, comprehensive glance at the paper in the machine. Then his twinkling eyes looked downward. On the desk, at Mr. Fairspeckle's elbow, lay a little pile of papers. The topmost one was partly covered with typewriting, and the wording was precisely the same as that on the paper in the machine. The phantom had seen enough. He drew his automatic from his pocket, then waited until Mr. Fairspeckle stopped writing and pulled the sheet from the machine. "'You seem to be fairly busy, Mr. Shea,' he observed in soft tones. Mr. Fairspeckle jerked up his shoulders, then sat as rigid as if suddenly turned into a statue. Finally, with slow and spasmodic motions, he turned his head and looked into the muzzle of the phantom's automatic. 
a startled look leap into his eyes and his sallow face turned a shade paler you he exclaimed i watered one of your ferns with the coffee hayuto handed me the phantom explained a cruel way to treat an inoffensive plant i'll admit but there was nothing else handy mind if i have a look lowering the weapon a trifle he picked up the sheet of paper mr fairspeckle had just drawn from the machine watching the older man out of the tail of an eye he read the typewritten lines in accordance with my promise i herewith announce the names of the seven gentlemen whom by certain means at my disposal i shall persuade to hand over half of their respective fortunes to me then followed a list of seven names each one suggestive of untold wealth and vast influence in the financial world and the phantom smiled as he noticed that w rufus fairspeckle was one of them by way of signature mr shay's name was typed at the bottom of the announcement not bad commented the phantom by including yourself among the seven victims you make sure that no suspicion becomes attached to the fair name of w rufus fairspeckle anyhow since you are one of the richest men in town it would look rather odd if your name were omitted congratulations mr shay the other looked stolidly into the muzzle of the automatic the phantom's sudden and unexpected appearance seemed to have paralyzed his tongue you could save a lot of time by taking carbon copies suggested the phantom riffling the sheets lying beside the machine you will need a hundred or more to plaster the town effectively i understand now why you took that long walk this morning there's nothing like having a pleasant pastime when one can't sleep what i don't understand is how you meant to put your plan into effect a sickly smile cruised about mr fairspeckle's bloodless lips oh i don't expect you to let me in on the secret the phantom went on with your past performances in mind i have no doubt you would have executed your threat in a manner becoming your genius there's only one thing about your achievements that has disappointed me i don't see why you had to copy my method so slavishly for a while i was almost certain that mr shea was one of my former associates and that's why he checked himself on the point of explaining why he had come out of hiding couldn't you have shown a little more originality an inarticulate mumble came from mr fairspeckle's lips his fingers fidgeted nervously over his knees well don't try to explain i suppose the police will attend to that part there will be quite a sensation when it becomes known that w rufus fairspeckle is the mysterious mr shea i wonder what drove you to it you were bored with the life of a gentleman of leisure i suppose and then you had a goose to pick with your old enemies i take it that was your chief motive well mr shea a dulcet twinkle interrupted him and he glanced quickly at the telephone on mr fairspeckle's desk you may answer he said after a moment's hesitation mr fairspeckle reached out a trembling hand for the instrument he put the receiver to his ear and spoke a feeble hello into the transmitter in the next instant his face went blank it's for you he announced gazing dazedly at the phantom for me the phantom stared incredulously at the instrument to the best of his knowledge his whereabouts was known to nobody but mr fairspeckle and the japanese servant quickly gathering himself he placed the automatic within easy reach and took the telephone from mr fairspeckle's hand he started as a voice came over the wire mr shea speaking it announced in level tones 
If you value Miss Hardwick's life, I would advise you to abandon your present plans. That is all. Then a click, and the connection was broken. Chapter 9 THE HOUSE OF LAUGHTER Mr. Shea! Time and again through the night following her arrival at Azure Crest, Helen's lips soundlessly formed the name she had involuntarily spoken upon seeing the man in the doorway. She tossed restlessly on her bed, her mind in that curious state on the boundary line between slumber and wakefulness when the imagination forms shadowy images and one's thoughts reach for elusive realities. Now and then, as a wild strain of laughter shattered the silence, she sat up and stared into the darkness. A cold tingle would trickle down her spine as the sounds rose to a hysterical crescendo, then fell to a gentle tinkle that made her flesh quiver, and finally died down to a haunting echo. Then, her sense of horror engulfed by overwhelming drowsiness, she would fall back against the pillow and drift into a state of soothing stupor. Finally dawn broke. Flickering wisps of sunlight fell on the floor, lighting up the dark corners and dispersing the evil host with which her imagination had peopled the gloom. A fresh breeze caressed her hot forehead and cooled the fever in her blood. She sat up and rubbed her eyes. Outside, the sun was glimmering on treetops and long stretches of lawn. The bright, pleasant room afforded a sharp contrast to the strident discords and monstrous visions that had distressed her throughout the night. Her recollections were still vague. Gradually, a train of memories swept upon her. It all came back to her now, her arrival at Azure Crest, her failure to find the gray phantom, the strange laughter and the hideous face she had seen at the window, Miss Neville's amazing story and the intercepted flight, and finally the appearance of the man at the sight of whom she had cried out the name of Mr. Shea. Again her recollections grew dim. Things had gone dark before her eyes as soon as she had spoken the name. She had heard a jumble of voices, and she believed someone had forced a drink down her throat. A sedative, perhaps, for after that she had known nothing but the intermittent outbursts of laughter and their accompaniment of strange fancies. She shuddered as she remembered them. Several voices, she felt sure, had joined in the chorus of unnatural laughter. It could mean only one thing that more than one inmate of the house was afflicted with the mysterious fever so vividly described by Miss Neville. Her mind was clearing rapidly now. She realized she was surrounded by dangers which she could neither gauge nor understand. Of one thing only could she be certain. Her eyes, while resting on the man in the doorway, had pierced the evil of mystery which had concealed the identity of the mysterious Mr. Shea. The discovery, confirming a suspicion that had first come to her in the Thelma Theater, had shocked and bewildered her, and on the impulse of the moment she had heedlessly called out his name. Now, in a calmer mood, she reproached herself for her indiscretion. She wondered whether Mr. Shea would dare let her live now that she had penetrated his secret. If he were as ruthless and unscrupulous as she supposed him to be, he would in all likelihood seal her lips forever. She might promise not to betray him, but Mr. Shea was too shrewd and cautious to rely on promises. He would be more apt to adopt the only course consistent with his safety. She shivered a little. Physical fear she had never known, for there was a strain of recklessness and audacity in her nature that blinded her eyes to dangers, but the thought of death gave her a chill. She did not know exactly why, but never before had life seemed as enticing as now. 
a determination to live spurred her mind to frantic effort she would outwit mr shea by her woman's weapons she had done some skillful fencing with them on several occasions in the past and she could use them again already she was casting about for a plan perhaps by a little clever acting she could convince mr shea that her calling of his name had been nothing but a hysterical outburst and without significance if she succeeded in this he would have no reason for taking her life the thought buoyed her she turned a smiling face to the door as it opened and admitted a woman carrying a tray she was thin and slatternly and she sighed repeatedly while transferring the breakfast dishes to a table which she placed beside helen's bed eat you poor thing she admonished a world of melancholy in her tones helen sipped the coffee it was strong and fragrant and gave her a needed stimulus why do you call me poor thing she inquired the woman heaved another sigh i'm not saying i can hold my tongue when i want to that's how i keep my job in this place it's a shame though really it is what is a shame helen looking into the slattern saturnine face with its ludicrously doleful expression felt an impulse to laugh in spite of her misgivings you're so young and pretty that's why i call it a shame oh well we all have to go that way sooner or later helen unpleasantly impressed by the innuendo tasted the toast which way she asked in casual tones that would be telling a long sigh racked the woman's scrawny chest i hear a lot of things around this place that i never tell better eat hearty dear it might be your last gosh i almost said something that time didn't i helen conquering her forebodings ate in silence for a time the slattern's funereal face and dismal insinuations were casting a spell of gloom over her which she found hard to shake off finally she tried a direct question do you mean that they are going to kill me the woman clasped her hands across her chest and raised mournful eyes to the ceiling you mustn't ask questions poor dear you'll find out soon enough anyhow there's a better world than this with this piece of doubtful consolation she gathered the dishes and with another disconsolate sigh walked out of the room helen tried to tell herself that the woman had merely been exercising her imagination and that her doleful hints had come out of thin air the meal had refreshed her and her spirits rose while she bathed her face in cold water and arranged her attire having finished she viewed herself with satisfaction in the mirror her elastic health and strength had obliterated nearly every trace of her distressing night a knock sounded on the door and mr slade walked in helen instantly steeled herself for an ordeal slade she had already guessed was mr shea's right-hand man he was smiling affably but something told her that her life depended on the outcome of the interview i trust you had a restful night miss hardwick he suavely inquired after seating himself i slept like a top helen assured him with a smile that belied her real emotion you see i was all fagged out when i retired i have a faint recollection that i was a bit hysterical too i suppose it was on account of that affair at the thelma theater the other night i received quite a shock naturally assented slade regarding her with a mingling of admiration and doubt yes you seemed somewhat upset last night you probably have no recollection of it 
but you fainted completely away and one of the maids put you to bed after the physician in attendance upon miss neville had administered a sedative i don't suppose you remember any of that it's all news to me declared helen innocently i'm sorry to have been so much trouble slade made a deprecatory gesture he edged his chair a little closer to the small table at which helen was seated she felt his cold gaze searching her face and to hide her confusion she began tracing figures in the dust that had accumulated on the surface of the table last night we were discussing the gray phantom slade remarked and she started a trifle at the mention of the name i regret i can give you no inkling as to his whereabouts i suppose you are very anxious to find him rather isn't it strange that he did not give you his new address he may have written it and the letter gone astray suggested helen a flush had tinged the healthy tan of her cheeks the moment slade introduced the subject of the gray phantom looking down at the table she noticed confusedly that her hand had been influenced by the thoughts that were uppermost in her mind in the thin layer of dust she had absently traced the gray phantom's initials it was a habit of hers cultivated since childhood to sketch figures and designs on whatever surface was handy and she had often told herself she must overcome it perhaps was slade's comment he looked at her in a way that caused her to wonder whether he had noticed the pencilings in the dust and she erased them with a quick sweep of her hand by the way he went on our conversation last night was interrupted by a a certain person remember helen knew that the critical moment had come she made a pretense of searching her memory i was very tired she said carefully choosing her words and i recall very little of what happened i seem to remember though that a motor horn sounded while we were talking yes and then slade bent eagerly forward helen's strained face indicated intense mental effort then isn't it odd that i don't seem able to remember a thing after that it is admitted slade and there was a subtle change in the quality of his voice perhaps i can refresh your memory suddenly a man's figure appeared in the doorway you stared at him in a way signifying that you had seen him before then you spoke a name a name echoed helen what name a name that has been on a great many lips of late mr shays isn't that strange murmured helen i wonder what on earth made me mention that name i suppose though she added quickly that it was because mr shay's name had been in my mind off and on ever since that terrible occurrence in the thelma theater yes that must be the reason the only reason miss hardwick what other reason could there be slade smiled in a way that awoke helen's dislike well it's conceivable that you were under the impression that the man in the doorway was mr shea that would not only have explained your excitement but also give ample reason for uttering his name helen opened her eyes wide but but i don't even remember seeing the man she protested artlessly so why should i suppose him to be mr shea the fact remains that you spoke mr shay's name just before you fainted away let's get at the subject from a different angle miss hardwick do you know who mr shay is helen having a curious feeling that her life was trembling in the balance shook her head 
You don't know his other name, the name by which he is known to the world at large? Again Helen made a negative gesture, and in the same instant she became aware that Slade's frosty gaze was following the movements of her right hand. Before she realized what was happening, he had left his chair and stepped up behind her, and now he was leaning over her shoulder and looking down at the table. "'So you lied,' he muttered in tones that sent a shiver through her body, at the same time pointing to the table. Helen looked down. She gave a violent start. While she had been fencing verbally with Slade, her hand had betrayed her. In her preoccupation she had not realized that another couplet of initials had appeared in the dust. With a sensation of defeat and despair she stared down at the tell-tale characters. The first letters in Mr. Shea's other name. Chapter 10 A Shot At noon of the same day, a scene equally tense, but of quite a different character, was being enacted in the library of W. Rufus Fairspeckle. Dazedly, the gray phantom set the telephone down. In tones too low for the older man to catch, he mumblingly repeated the startling message that had just come to him over the wire. Mr. Shea speaking. If you value Miss Hardwick's life, I would advise you to abandon your present plans. One by one, and in the order in which they had been spoken, the words trickled into his benumbed consciousness. He had heard Mr. Shea's voice over the wire. He had been mistaken then, and the shrunken and wizened man, seated before him with eyes staring and mouth agape, could not be Mr. Shea. Even the evidence of the typewritten slips lying on the desk seemed to mean nothing that the fact that the notorious rogue had just communicated with him by telephone. "'What, what's the matter?' stammered Mr. Fairspeckle, who, not having the faintest inkling as to the nature of the message received by the phantom, was at a loss to understand the latter's demeanor. "'Anything wrong?' The phantom scarcely heard him. The significance of the last part of Mr. Shea's message came to him in a flash. In a twinkling his mind was functioning again. His eyes were threatening, like miniature thunderclouds. A new and dynamic impulse seemed to dominate his whole being. He snatched up the telephone directory and found a number. Then he fairly hurled himself at the telephone, frantically jigged the hook up and down, shouted a number into the transmitter, and waited breathlessly till the connection was established. A woman's voice, evidently that of a servant, answered. Miss Hardwick was not in, she explained, and when pressed for further information, admitted that she had not been seen since breakfast the previous day. Mr. Hardwick, ill at ease because of his daughter's absence, was instituting inquiries for her in various directions, and the servant did not know where he could be reached. The phantom's eyes blazed as he set the instrument down with a slam. Mr. Fairspeckle, a flabbergasted look in his bulging eyes, seemed utterly at a loss to comprehend what was going on. For a moment the phantom eyed him narrowly, then cast a bewildered glance at the typewritten slips, and finally turned abruptly on his heels and dashed from the room. No one interrupted him. He suspected that Hayuta was lurking somewhere in the background, but he saw nothing of the sly-footed servant as he rushed from the apartment and, forgetting the existence of the elevator, scurried down three flights of stairs. The ferret-eyed individual whom he had seen from the window was still standing at the opposite curb, but he did not deign a single glance in the phantom's direction. Block after block, spurred on by a medley of anguishing doubts and suspicions, the phantom continued his heedless progress, 
conscious only of the one agonizing thought that something had happened to Helen Hardwick. Presently he awoke to a realization of the futility and recklessness of his conduct. His fears for Helen Hardwick had blunted his wits and stultified his reason, making him forget his old-time caution and nimbleness of mind. To no purpose he was rushing blindly into a net of dangers. With a mutter of disgust at his childish impetuosity, he drew in his steps and turned into a convenient doorway. A glance up and down the street assured him that, thanks to luck alone, his headlong course seemed to have attracted no attention. He scanned the crowd on all sides, but there was no sign of either espionage or pursuit. He had vaguely expected to be followed by the keen-eyed watcher he had seen on the sidewalk outside the Whipple Hotel, but the man was nowhere in sight. For the present, at least, the phantom was safe. Now he must think clearly and act coolly. He could not rid himself of the suspicion that Helen's volatile nature and venturesome disposition had led her into some fearful predicament. He knew she had an infinite capacity for handling difficult situations, but the knowledge gave him scant comfort. He revolved the problem of her disappearance in his mind. She had been missing for more than twenty-four hours. He sensed a dim significance in the fact that she had passed out of sight the morning following the tragedy at the Thelma Theater, and of a sudden he asked himself whether there could be any possible connection between her disappearance and the death of Virginia Darrow. Several circumstances lent plausibility to the theory. Chief among them was the mysterious warning the phantom had received from Mr. Shea, the man who was generally believed to have been implicated in Miss Darrow's death. The phantom's mind was working swiftly now, leaping barriers and rushing straight to conclusions. It was Helen's play, he remembered, that had been produced on the night of the tragedy, and it was very probable that she had been present at the premiere performance. Knowing her as he did, he thought it conceivable that she had come into possession of some vital facts bearing on the tragedy. Her inquisitive mind, though untainted by vulgar curiosity, was always dipping into mysteries of one sort or another, and it was possible that on this occasion her natural bent had led her into conflict with Mr. Shea. Almost before he realized what he was doing, the phantom was in a taxicab, shouting to the chauffeur to drive him to the Thelma Theater. It seemed the logical starting point in his search. At least, he did not know where else to begin, and by visiting the scene of Miss Darrow's death, he might be able to pick up some clue to Helen's movements. The doors were open, and he thought this somewhat strange in view of the fact that a poster on the outer wall announced that the performances of His Soul's Master had been discontinued, but the circumstance did not linger long in his mind. The box office and lobby being empty, he passed unchallenged into the auditorium. For a few moments, while his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, he stood just inside the door, trying to call back to mind each detail of the tragedy as it had been narrated in the newspapers, and presently there came to him a conviction that he was not alone, but that someone was watching him intently. He could not account for the impression, for no sound reached his ears, and the interior was only a mass of gently undulating shadows in which he saw no indication of another's presence. The atmosphere was somewhat oppressive, and a multitude of faint scents lingered in the air, hinting that the theater had not been ventilated since the last performance. Glancing sharply into the gloom about him, the phantom groped his way down the center aisle, then explored the passageways at each side of the house, and finally looked into each of the boxes. His search availed him nothing, and at length he was forced to admit that his imagination had tricked him. Walking to the rear of the house, 
he stood with his back against a pillar and gazed toward the last row of seats to the left. It was there, according to the diagram he had seen in one of the papers, that Virginia Darrow had sat when seized with a strange fit of laughter. Again he wondered what bearing the woman's death might have on Mr. Shea's latest venture. The connection, if there was one, seemed so remote that he came to the conclusion that Mr. Shea must be at work on a very intricate and deep-laid scheme. Then it occurred to him that his speculations, founded on insufficient facts, were a waste of time. They were not helping him to solve the mystery of Helen Hardwick's disappearance. As was his habit when he wished to concentrate his mind on a problem, he took a cigarette from his case, then struck a match against the side of his shoe. Absently he held the fluttering light to the tip of the cigarette and inhaled. Suddenly he sprang aside, for a sound, all but too faint for his ears to detect, had warned him of danger, and in the same instant a sharp crack and a flash of fire leaped out of the darkness. Then an object whizzed past his head and with a thudding sound embedded itself in the pillar against which he had been leaning. In a moment he had extinguished his cigarette. He could see now that its glowing point, together with the match, had made him a target for the person who had fired the shot. The bullet had passed so close to his head that, but for his quick and agile backward spring, it would undoubtedly have killed him. His narrow escape had an exhilarating effect, and he dashed toward the point where he had seen the flash of fire, determined to capture the would-be murderer. It was his impression that the shot had been fired only a dozen feet away, and he did not think the man could have escaped. In the gloom he could not distinguish objects clearly, and he dashed headlong against a post. The compact sent a stinging sensation through his head, and in the same moment a figure glided silently past him and was swallowed by the shadows at the other side of the house. Again the phantom rushed forward. A swiftly moving object, a shade darker than the surrounding dusk, was discernible down the aisle leading to the boxes at the right. The phantom darted after it, but when he reached the point his quarry had disappeared. For an instant he stopped, uncertain which way to turn, and in the midst of his perplexity the varicolored lights along the walls were flashed on. The phantom whirled around. Near one of the exits in the rear of the house stood a tall, slenderly proportioned man. His long, glossy hair was rumpled, and even at a distance the phantom could see that his features, so regularly molded as to give an impression of effeminacy, were intensely pale. He approached swiftly. The two men eyed each other intently before either spoke. "'You are Mr. Starr, I believe?' began the phantom, recognizing the other from photographs he had seen in the newspapers. Starr nodded. His right hand was clutching a revolver. Coming closer, the phantom noticed that his nose was discolored and swollen, probably the result of the attack that had preceded the disappearance of Virginia Darrow's body. "'I owe you an apology for intruding like this,' he went on. "'But the formalities can wait. There was a shot fired here a few moments ago, and I believe it was meant for me.' I was at work in my office upstairs when I heard something that sounded like a revolver shot, explained Starr. I armed myself and came down to investigate. His voice, at other times perfectly modulated, was a little husky, and he seemed unduly conscious of his disfigured nose. He maintained a tight grip on his pistol while regarding the phantom with a look of suspicion. "'We ought to search the house at once,' suggested the phantom. "'The scoundrel can't have gone far.' Starr readily acquiesced, but from time to time while they went on with the search 
the phantom felt the other's stealthy gaze searching his face, and each time he saw a look of dawning recognition in Starr's eyes. He thought nothing of it, for the capture of the man who had fired the shot seemed of far greater importance. Deep in his mind was a faint and remote hope that the fellow, if caught, might be persuaded to tell something of what had happened to Helen Hardwick. They searched every conceivable space in the auditorium, back of the stage, and finally in the storerooms and dressing rooms down below, but without avail. As they abandoned their quest, the phantom thought he saw signs of increasing nervousness on Starr's part. "'Strange how the scoundrel disappeared,' he remarked when once more they stood in the back of the auditorium. "'No stranger than what happened here night before last.' Starr spoke with a touch of petulance in his voice and manner. "'Mr. Shea and his henchmen seem to have a knack of walking through solid walls. What I object to most is his evident determination to make my theater the scene of his diabolical activities. By the way,' and he fixed the phantom with a look of mingled perplexity and suspicion. "'Haven't you and I met before?' "'Not in person, unless I am mistaken.' The phantom, alert against the slightest threatening move on the other's part, smiled faintly. "'The newspapers have been kind enough to give me some publicity from time to time, and you may have seen my photograph. Suppose we let it go at that.' "'As you wish, of course,' murmured Starr, his lips twitching. "'But we shall be able to talk to better advantage if we first complete the introductions. I was almost certain I recognized you at first glance. You are the gray phantom. But don't get startled,' he quickly added as the phantom suddenly stiffened. "'My interest in life is purely aesthetic.' I am trying, in my small and humble way, to uplift the drama from the sordid depths into which it has fallen through the stupidity and avarice of managers. The capture and punishment of criminals interest me not at all. To be perfectly frank with you, as between the police and a fascinating rogue like yourself, my sympathies are with the latter. He made an expressive gesture and the phantom watched with interest the slight, quick and marvelously impressive motions of his hands. Though this was his first meeting with the man himself, the gestures, as well as the characteristic backward toss of the head, seemed oddly familiar. "'I think you are mistaken about one thing,' Starr went on, his nervousness returning. Is there any reason why anyone should wish to put you out of the way? None that I know of, replied the phantom thoughtfully. I suppose I have enemies, but it didn't occur to me that anyone was after my life until that shot was fired. And weren't you a bit precipitate in jumping at the conclusion that the bullet was intended for you? Suppose you give me the details. The phantom told him the meager facts of the firing of the shot. "'There you are!' exclaimed Starr when he had finished. "'The fellow couldn't see your face. All he saw was the match, and he used that as a target, knowing you were holding it directly in front of your face while lighting the cigarette.' He took a few quick, nervous steps back and forth. He clenched and unclenched his hands, as if trying to quell a rising trepidation. Suddenly he paused directly in front of the phantom. "'That bullet was not intended for you, but for me,' he declared emphatically. "'Are you sure?' "'Not sure, but I have the best of reasons for supposing that such is the fact. I have had several intimations of danger in the past few weeks.' but it isn't necessary to go into details. Since night before last, I have wondered what prompted Miss Darrow to send me the facetiously worded note hinting that Mr. Shea was in the house. 
if she were alive i am sure she could tell us several interesting things about but what's the good of supposing miss darrow will never be able to tell what was in her mind when she wrote me that note only one thing is certain she was killed because she had in some unexplained manner learned mr shay's identity the phantom regarded him narrowly some people think to be of the opinion that i am mr shea rot the similarity between your tactics and those of mr shea is only superficial the essential difference ought to be plain even to a stupid headquarters detective besides you never took life or but the idea is too absurd to waste breath on let us be practical you have not yet explained why you are honoring the Thelma Theater with this visit. The phantom was about to reply when one of the doors in front was pushed open and the shadow of a masculine figure fell across the floor. After a glance into the face of the newcomer, the phantom sensed danger and tried to retreat into a corner where the dim light held out a faint hope of brief security. But it was too late stay right where you are commanded the man who had just entered didn't know the gray phantom was back in town step out here where i can look at you chapter eleven an eavesdropper the phantom shrugged his shoulders and stepped forward concealing his misgivings behind a smiling and carefree exterior he knew Lieutenant Culligore from past encounters with the man, and he had learned to respect him for his shrewdness as well as his sense of fairness. Now he looked straight into the muddy and deceptively lazy eyes of the man from headquarters. Once the phantom had assisted him in solving a singularly perplexing mystery, but he knew that Culligore was not the kind of man to let sentiment interfere with duty. There were times when it was difficult for the gray phantom to realize that he was still an outlaw and that several prison sentences were hanging over his head. The poignant fact came back to him now as he gazed into the eyes of one of the keenest manhunters of the detective bureau. "'You sure have nerve,' observed Culligore, a trace of reluctant admiration in his tones. "'Don't you know there's a warrant out for your arrest?' several of them i believe calmly replied the phantom lieutenant culligore took a cigar from his vest pocket and lighted it with elaborate care then he turned to star mr shay's gang certainly handed you an awful wallop the other night he observed gazing frowningly at the disfigured organ that's a peach of a nose you've got star flushed angrily but controlled himself "'I've got a few words to say to this gentleman privately,' Culligore went on, inclining his head toward the phantom. Star, accepting his dismissal as gracefully as his indignation permitted, walked out. Culligore's small eyes, twinkling humorously through a cloud of tobacco smoke, followed his progress till the door closed behind him. Then he slowly turned toward the phantom." star is my idea of a perfect gentleman he musingly observed he can get mad clean through and still keep his coat on was the shot fired at you or at him shot for a moment the phantom stared bewilderedly how did you know my sense of smell is fairly good said culligore sniffing I noticed there was powder smoke in the air the moment I walked in. What became of the bullet? The phantom explained. With a listless air, the lieutenant examined the point where the leaden slug had entered the pillar. I'll bet a pair of pink socks that the rascal who fired the shot is a safe distance from here by this time. What I'd like to know is whether he was aiming at you or at Star star thinks the bullet was meant for him said the phantom thoughtfully he may be right but i have my doubts 
he is the imaginative type that believes he is being pursued by secret enemies and all that sort of thing on the other hand i can't see why anybody should waste a chunk of good lead on me unless he stopped short as an idea suddenly occurred to him unless mr shea should have a goose to pick with you culligore filled in and the phantom marveled at the way the detective had read his unspoken thought it's always safe to look for a shower of bullets whenever the gray phantom bobs up by the way and culligore frowned disapprovingly what's the idea don't you know the climate in this town is mighty unhealthy for a man like you i am aware of it the phantom's lips tightened into a grim line but i had to risk it culligore i couldn't sit idle while but first let me ask you one question some people seem to think that i am mr shea do you agree with them culligore pulled thoughtfully at his cigar his eyes seemed to be searching every remote corner of the phantom's mind no he said finally i don't and i don't see it makes any difference you're the gray phantom and that's reason enough for me to pinch you there are times when i hate my job but duty is duty i wish you hadn't shown up just at this time some of the higher-ups are dead sure you are mr shea and the whole town is on tenterhooks on account of the notices posted last night everybody expects mr shea to strike but nobody knows where the blow is going to fall you can see how things are why the devil didn't you stay where you belong i couldn't replied the phantom then he regarded the lieutenant with a slow carefully measuring glance Culligore was one of the few men he had met whom he could instinctively trust. There had been clashes between them in the past, but the lieutenant had always fought fairly. Choosing his words with great deliberation, the phantom explained why he had come out of hiding to cross swords with Mr. Shea. "'That's just like the gray phantom,' was Culligore's comment when he had finished. You stick your head in the noose just because somebody else is copying your tricks. Well, anyhow, I admire your nerve. Too bad you and I belong to opposite camps. We could have a lot of fun tracking Mr. Shea together. He shook his head as if to banish a pleasing but impossible hope. No use wishing things were different, though. I don't exactly like the idea but I've got to take you along to headquarters. You will have to take me in an ambulance, then. There was a note of challenge in the phantom's tones, and his figure tensed perceptibly. You'll never take me alive, Culligore. It simply can't be done. And you will have the scrap of your life before you take me dead. I am going to see this thing through if I have to fight the whole police department of New York City. The fact that Mr. Shea is stealing my tactics isn't the only reason. I learned something this morning that is of vastly more importance. By the way, and the phantom fairly jabbed the question at the lieutenant, have you seen anything of Miss Helen Hardwick? Culligore's lazy eyes opened a little wider. Not since yesterday morning. She and I had quite an argument about Mr. Shea. We were standing almost exactly where you and I are standing now. She knows how to fence with words. I haven't made up my mind yet whether she or I got the best of the argument. The phantom smiled, despite his impatience. What did she think of Mr. Shea? How can anybody tell what a woman thinks? You can make a guess, of course, but the chances are either that you are wrong or that you are making just exactly the kind of guess she wants you to make. Miss Hardwick left me pretty much up in the air, but I have a feeling all the time that she had discovered something that led her to think that you were Mr. Shea. Oh, mumbled the phantom. Then he stood silent for a few moments. Where did Miss Hardwick go from here? 
Kelligore shrugged. Ask me something easy. She walked out of that door, and that's all I'm sure of. There was another question or two I wanted to ask her, and that's why I dropped around here today, thinking she might show up again. She seemed very much wrought up over Mr. Shea. With an impetuous gesture, the phantom placed his hand on the lieutenant's arm. "'Miss Hardwick has disappeared,' he announced quickly, "'and I fear she has blundered into the clutches of Mr. Shea.' "'Eh?' The mask of listlessness dropped in a twinkling from Culligore's face. He was instantly tense and alert. "'What's that?' "'I called up her home this morning. Nobody seems to know what has become of her. A little later I received a telephone message warning me that— But I see I shall have to tell you the whole story in order to make things clear. Briefly the phantom related his encounter with Mr. Fairspeckle, the events that had occurred at the apartment of the retired financier, and finally the warning message that had come over the wire. "'Now you can understand,' he concluded, why I don't intend to submit to arrest until Miss Hardwick has been found. Culligore's cigar had gone out while the phantom was speaking. Now he lighted it again, sent a few clouds of smoke curling toward the ceiling, then peered intently into the phantom's face. Finally he jerked his head up and down as if he had seen a light. "'The thing to do,' he declared, is to take the shortest route and go direct to Mr. Shea and ask him what he has done with Miss Hardwick. The phantom laughed bitterly. Beautifully simple. The only difficulty is that we haven't the slightest idea who Mr. Shea is or where to find him. Otherwise, your suggestion is capital. A queer smile curled Culligore's lips. Sometimes the gray phantom isn't playing in very good form. But then every man gets a bit foolish when he has a girl on the brain. Your thinking cap isn't on straight today, or you wouldn't have let Fairspeckle pull the wool over your eyes the way he did. Fairspeckle? You don't think— He acted queer all morning, didn't he? Yes, but— and didn't he try to put you to sleep by drugging your coffee? True, but he— And didn't you see him typing the notices with Mr. Shea's name at the bottom? But the telephone message— Yes, I know, said Culligore patiently. That's where he duped you to a brown finish. You would have seen the trick at once if your thinking machinery had been in good condition. I don't know, Fair Speckle, but from what you have told me, he must be a sharp one. My experience has taught me never to trust a man who can't sleep nights. It's a bad conscience that keeps him awake in the first place, and a man suffering from loss of sleep is likely to go in for any kind of deviltry. Maybe that's what happened to Fair Speckle. Anyhow, the way he pulled the wool over your eyes proves he is a slick one. Then you think Fairspeckle is Mr. Shea? If he isn't, why should he be typing those notices? Just look at it this way. Fairspeckle saw you suspected him. He didn't like that a bit. To throw you off your guard, he pretended to suspect you. You caught him with the goods when you saw him typing the notices. Right away you started in denouncing him as Mr. Shea. Then, right in the midst of a dramatic moment, the telephone rings. The voice at the other end asks for you. You're told that Mr. Shea is speaking and that Miss Hardwick will suffer unless you keep hands off. That gives you a jolt, of course, and all you can think of is the girl. You don't stop to question whether the man at the other end is really Mr. Shea. For all you know, he might be Tom Brown or Bill Jones, but you're too excited to think of that. I don't blame you. I'd been just as easy if I had been in your place. A blank look crossed the phantom's face while Culligore was speaking. 
it was quickly followed by an expression of mingling comprehension and self-disgust i see it now i've been as gullible as a ten-year-old the message purporting to come from mr shea was meant to divert my suspicions from fair speckle he might have been prepared for some such emergency or else he signaled hayuto while i wasn't looking the japanese could easily have gotten in touch with one of the members of fair speckle's gang and instructed him to call me up and give me the prearranged message but just how it was done doesn't matter the important point is that i was taken in i am wondering now whether the threat in regard to miss hardwick was pure bluff or whether she is really in danger i wouldn't take chances cautioned Culligore. If I were you, I would call on Mr. Fairspeckle tonight and have a confidential chat with him. He may not want to talk, but maybe you can persuade him. Of course, as an officer of the law, I must warn you there mustn't be any rough stuff. Culligore's twinkling eyes gazed toward the ceiling. Then you have abandoned your intention of dragging me over to headquarters? Culligore did not answer directly, but the faint grin on his lips was eloquent. "'I would advise you to watch your step,' he said softly. "'The moment it becomes known that the gray phantom is in town, there will be the niftiest little manhunt you ever saw. I wish you luck. In the meantime, I'm going to tackle the case from another angle. I'd give a pair of pink socks to know just when, where, and how Mr. Shea is going to strike. He tilted his chin against his hand and lapsed into deep thought. When he looked up several minutes later, the phantom was gone. Very softly, with a twinkle in his eyes, he stepped to a recess in the wall toward which he had cast an occasional furtive glance during his talk with the phantom. On a marble shelf extended across the niche were a number of potted ferns, and behind them was a small window, artistically decorated to render it opaque. Culligore, noticing that it stood open a crack, pricked up his ears and listened. From the other side came a faint scraping sound, as if someone were hiding there. Culligore nodded elatedly as he tiptoed away. He seemed immensely gratified at having verified his suspicion that his interview with the gray phantom had been overheard. 